He's a professor for the University of Tennessee Extension with statewide extension responsibilities since 1992. His office is located in Nashville. He earned his undergraduate degree in biology at the University of Cincinnati, his master's in entomology at Clemson University, and his PhD in entomology at Ohio State University. Dr. Hale's area of expertise uh, is sort of narrowly limited since he's only responsible for everything I'm about to tell you. He's responsible across the state for entomology of horticultural crops, which includes turf, sports turfs, solid and uh, golf course and landscape. He's responsible for ornamentals, which include landscape, nursery, greenhouse, and interior scape, fruit, small fruit and tree fruit, vegetables, greenhouse and field grown, and uh, the dark type of tobacco. That's all he's responsible for. As an extension entomologist for UT, Dr. Hale emphasizes the delivery of effective IPM programs. Um, under links on the UT website, he has six full pages of publications with an additional cache of more recent documents listed in his veto. Um, he notes in one of his online profiles that he's reached his target office audi audiences by mass media, social media, group meetings, email, phone calls, field visits, office visits, and now I guess you can say Zoom presentations as well. Um, and, and you'll notice as the evening goes along that it's obvious these two professors know each other. And you'll also find that they've um, written a number of documents uh, that they were both authors for. Uh, I was particularly intrigued with Dr. Hale's publication on the pickle worm. And I cause if you read all your, your chapters, you know what that is, but it's a cucurbic loving larva of the Diaphania nitidias, dialis, dialis, something like that. Anyway, it's a small moth, moth that likes cucurbics. And I've wasted enough time. Are you ready, doctor? Yes, I am. Let me get this screen shared. Log in. Let me. All right, there you go, doc. Up. Okay. I'm going to minimize my thing here. Well, great. You know, this year I, I started in uh, at UT in Nashville with Alan in 1992. And Alan had been there now since 1985. So we've spent a career together. And this is probably this uh, 2020 was the year I saw Alan the least because I worked so much at home. But uh, Dr. Wyndham lives close to the office and he, he was in the office every, every, about every day last year. And we ran our diagnostic lab, even though we didn't have a diagnostician from February through the end of July. So it was a challenging year to say the least, but uh, we got a hard working crew, as you all know, in the UT Extension. I'm gonna show you guys a lot of nice pictures of insects because that's one of the most fun things to do with insects because people just can't believe all the variety of shapes and forms and colors. So in your publication, in your chapter, I believe 13, uh, you'll, you'll see a lot of information that you need to read that too. I'm not gonna cover everything that's in that chapter, but I wanna show you a nice overview of common insects and mites that you'll see in the backyard. So are you ready? All right, let's get going here. Well, one thing we know about uh, insects is that they will attack plants in many different ways. There's chewing insects. They attack the, could chew on the leaves or they could chew into the, the wood of the tree if it happened to be a tree, but they have chewing mandibles. It could be caterpillars, beetles, a lot of different pets. Other insects have their mouth parts modified so that they're piercing sucking. 
usually stylet. Think of a, a hypodermic needle and they will actually uh, pierce this, the uh, plant. Some of them have two, actually two tubes, one to pump in saliva to dissolve plant tissue, the other tube within that uh, proboscis to suck out the juice then. So an example of that would be a lace bug or scale insects. Internal feeding could mean uh, leaf miners. They're flattened, they live between the top and bottom layer of the leaf. They could also be wood boring insects that go inside and live inside the wood of the plant. See, there's a lot of variety in there already. Galls are very interesting. It's one of the last things I'll talk about tonight. I'll show you some pictures, but they actually communicate with the, through the DNA with, with hormones and such so that they can actually tell the plant what to do. And the plant and the insect have co-evolved over millions of years so that the plant will actually grow a nice little house for the insect or mite to develop inside. So they're communicating. That, that means there's been a long relationship. Subterranean, below the ground, it could be uh, white grubs, it could be termites, a lot of things feeding on the roots of plants, white fringe beetles, for instance. Egg laying. You know, in uh, East Tennessee, especially, we're gonna have a, a brood 10 of this periodical cicada this year. It'll come out in May, usually around Mother's Day. Can you believe that? All the, all the children come out by the millions and uh, it's gonna be mainly in East Tennessee, but uh, they lay their eggs in the twigs and that's what causes the damage. So the males make all the racket as they call the females and the females damage the twigs as they lay their a double row of eggs. And diseases, you think of insects as transmitting diseases, they sure can. Uh, they can either, aphids often transmit viruses, for instance, and I'll show you some other things too. So let's get going here. Let's start out with the chewing mouth parts. Everybody knows this, don't they? What's this one here? The bagworm. And you know, it's cold outside. But inside that bag that had a female um, in it, a female caterpillar and then an adult, there'll be hundreds of eggs. And those eggs can survive freezing temperatures. Now, if you get up into Minnesota where it really gets cold or Wisconsin, some of those eggs will die. But here in Tennessee, I'm sorry, it just doesn't hardly get cold enough. So we usually have plenty of bagworms hatching every, every uh, spring. Once they, uh, the, there's the uh, caterpillar. You can see what it looks like inside that silken bag with, uh, with plant material. You'll see the uh, empty pupil case that emerged from the male moth that emerged uh, last summer. And it flew around and found a female and she was inside the bag. She ne never leaves the bag. And if you look at the bottom right there, the female looks more like a pupa. She doesn't have wings doesn't look like an adult moth or anything. And she stays in the bag and the male mates with her and then her abdomen actually fills with eggs. Then she will die and entomb those eggs. So the eggs are inside the female, which is inside this waterproof silken bag. So they're quite protected. So come May, something's gonna happen. These, uh, these little eggs will, let me jump back, will hatch out and so, Usually mid to late May, early June is when you need to treat uh, for uh, bagworms, for the caterpillars. And they will repel out on silken threads out the bottom of the bag and start uh, feeding on uh, tissue, plant tissue. And they can also on those silken threads balloon. They can get dispersed. So it's a windy day when they're coming out, they will fly to nearby plants. So try to pick the bags off if you can. If you can't, you're gonna to need to spray by the first week of June. And a lot of people for caterpillars like to use Dipel or BT, they call it. The Cellus thuringiensis is a bacterial toxin. You spray it, it's safe on beneficials. 
but when caterpillars eat it, it gives them a tummy ache, kills them, and it's a very effective product to use. Here's another caterpillar that's an early uh, one, probably our earliest uh, caterpillar we see is the uh, eastern uh, tent caterpillar, and then also the forest tent caterpillar. The eastern tent caterpillar has a white stripe down the back. Forest tent looks like keyhole shaped, old fashioned keyhole shaped white markings. The, cat, the uh, moth is a sort of a cinnamon colored moth you can see here for the forest tent caterpillar. And you probably would never notice the moth. And here's what they look like when they first come out, Eastern tent caterpillar. So one of these days come spring, these wild cherry trees are gonna start putting out the first leaves. And when those leaves are first coming out, it's when these eggs hatch. In Eastern tent caterpillar, they make webbing in the crotches of the, the branches. And you can see that little penny there. They're not very big at first. You can just pull those out, squish them, or you can prune them out. Uh, the forest tent caterpillar makes its web nest on the side of the trunk. But again, BT would be a good product to control these with because they have some natural controls and you don't want to kill the good bugs, so to speak. When we get into summer, we have other webbing type caterpillars. This one happens to be the fall webworm. Okay, so the Female moth is a white moth. She lays an egg mass on the leaves and she can lay eggs on walnut trees and pecan trees, a lot of big shade trees. You'll see these webs and these webs will be where? They're not gonna be in the interior. They're gonna be out on the ends of the branches. And I'll, I'll, often you can just prune these out with a, if you have a pole pruner, you can reach up and take them out that way. So you don't always have to use insecticides, prune them out. And the good thing is they generally don't totally defoliate a tree, although you might see a persimmon occasionally get totally defoliated, but they will put out new leaves. And you might have a couple generations of these. Now, we often talk about invasive pests coming from Asia and other places, Europe, uh, Japanese beetle, of course, from the Orient. Well, this little white moth here is now in China. And in China, since we don't have the biological control that we have here in the States, all those beneficial insects and diseases, we can see whole forests that will get webbed up and defoliated when these outbreaks occur. So fall webworm, since it's not in its native range in Asia, can do a lot more damage. So it's a major pest there. Yellow neck caterpillars are also very interesting. As you can see here, they're also gregarious feeders. They, they uh, brothers and sisters feed together on the leaf. And at first, when they're small, they'll just graze. They'll just take the top layer of the leaf off. But as they get bigger, they devour the whole leaf. Their egg masses that the uh, moth later, you can see the little white eggs there. So there might be a hundred or more eggs, it looks like. They're either, they come in two forms, a red and yellow form, and then you'll get the black and yellow form also, as they, I believe as they get older. So of course, to get bigger, insects have to do what? They have to molt, shed their skin, and then they have a, a new exoskeleton underneath, and that's how they're able to molt. And usually you have four, four or five instars or stages of these larval uh, caterpillars. Now, one product, uh, one uh, publication, I mean, that we have is called Commercial Insect and Mite Control for Trees, Shrubs, and Flowers, PB 1589. You might want to keep that one handy. All our publications are uh, online. UT Extension has our publications. So uh, once you get there, you can either uh, type in, you'll see a little drop down box, and you can type in PB 1589 or put in Frank Hale or Alan Windham, and you can look at all our extension publications. And the more you work for a place, the more publications you seem to have. So it's just a job now just to keep up with updating all the publications we've done over the years. But uh, that's something we like to do is uh, at least a yearly as much as possible if we can get most of them up upgraded. A few years ago in 2017, 
some entomologists, plant pathologists, weed scientists, we, we said, we need a regional guide. And that's sort of the trend for these guides. We get experts from across the region. And so the Southeastern U.S. Pest Control Guide, it probably could use an update. There's a few chemicals that have changed over the years, but it's a real good publication. It's over 200 pages, I believe. So lots of good information. It's available online, uh, but uh, there are, they put out a few uh, paper publications, and I think you can go online and actually buy a, one out of on a printed one. I've seen them for sale before, but they're free online, so might as well just check it out. You know what that little lace bug is? That looks like an azalea lace bug. You see how they get the name? The adults have lacy like wings, beautiful insects. When we think about uh, turf grass insects, of course we have white grubs that feed underground on the roots, but we also have a lot of things that feed in the thatch and on the, in the grass, actually blades of the grass like uh, army worms, for instance. This is a fall army worm feeding on fescue. One way we can tell the fall army worm, if you look at the head of it, it's usually a darker head capsule. In the bottom right there, you can see it looks like an upside down or inverted Y shape, a little lighter. Those are sutures or uh, in the insect head. And you can see it looks like an upside down Y. You can really see it clearly on fall army worms. These insects are semi-tropical. They don't overwinter here in Tennessee. It's in the Gulf states they overwinter or in Texas. And they will come up in spring uh, spring and summer uh, winds will bring them up, storm fronts. And a few years ago, I think it was 2015, we had a really big outbreak across the whole upper south and in the deep south. But most years we don't have huge outbreaks, but they're always something that we could be looking for. The top right shows you the pupal case, the empty pupa. Not all pupa have silken cocoons in Lepidopter. Some do, some don't. These are, lay, these are found in the thatch. When the uh, female moth flies up from Texas or wherever she came from, she will want to lay her eggs and usually lays the eggs on vertical structures, fence posts, benches, you know, things outside, even a, um, you know, a porch, uh, side of a porch, any kind of vertical structure. And notice that most of the damage initially is going to be around buildings or other structures that are lit because they're attracted to the lights. So they're attracted to the lights, they lay their eggs. Now there's no lights around, they're going to lay it evenly probably in the turf grass. But if you do have a lit area of your lawn, you know, that's going to probably get attacked first. We use a soap flush to sample. We get a couple teaspoons of uh, soap soapy dishwashing detergent like a lemon joy. You add that in a bucket of water, and, uh, probably a gallon or two of water, and you pour that over uh, four square feet, two foot by two foot. And uh, we can do that because that will irritate the insects and bring them to the surface. It's a good way to, to sample for them. I'll show you a picture here in a minute. Here's a nice picture showing the egg mass. So some caterpillar, some uh, Moths will lay single eggs like a black cutworm on, on blades of grass, but other insects lay egg masses. So you'll get, you can get a lot of caterpillars very quickly. You can see that uh, on a post there, an egg mass has been laid. And the moth is just sort of a nondescript moth, has some markings on it. And there's your little uh, soap. Uh, Disclosing solution, we call it. And some landscape managers, golf course folks, they do this. They'll put the little frame down, pour the soapy water. Any caterpillars will be forced to the surface. If you did this every week or two throughout the summer, just for the fun of it, you could see what was happening in your, in your uh, lawn situation. And it will bring um, also bill bugs and other insects to the surface, but not your white grubs that are below the surface. We have a publication, uh, Commercial Turf Grass Insect Control, PB1342, and has a lot of control recommendations for the commercial growers. We also have a publication for uh, 
lawn, you know, typical backyard lawns and has uh, turf grass pest too. Okay, let's talk about something else. Look at this interesting looking insect. What could that be? Yeah, it looks like a uh, soft light, isn't it? Well, we, we, the, the larvae of these are caterpillar-like, but they're not gonna be moths or butterflies when they grow up. They're not in the Lepidoptera. They're actually related to wasps, bees, and hornets. They're in the Hymenoptera. And so saw flies, the adults are bee-like things. The female has a saw-like ovipositor, which she uses to insert uh, her eggs and plant material. Here's an oak slug saw fly, adult. Now the larvae, don't those look like, looks like a typical caterpillar. Uh, they have a head capsule, they have front six legs, jointed appendages, legs out front, and then they have little pro legs. The difference on these are they have more pro legs. They actually have uh, more than five pair of pro legs. Lepidoptera, caterpillars that like a bagworm or an Eastern tent caterpillar have uh, five pair of pro legs, but these usually have eight. And also at the ends of those pro legs, those little on the abdomen, uh, they won't have the hooks that you find with Lepidoptera, the little crochets we call them. Conifer sawflies are probably the most damaging ones you'll see because they can defoliate pine. Now they usually don't kill the pine, but they, but they will defoliate. Here's some conifer sawflies here. The introduced pine sawfly uh, came from Europe, and it has these little cocoons that they'll cement to the tw to the uh, branches. You can see it's a little buzzy bee looking thing, and look at the red arrows there. Looks like eight different pair of these fleshy pro legs on the abdomen. Okay, so since that's more than five pair, these are saw flies. Why does that? Why am I telling you this? Because BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, Dipel, Thuricide, those type of products, the bacterial toxin that kills Lepidoptera caterpillars doesn't do a thing to, to these sawflies. So there, so I've had people spray BT insecticides in, on sawflies and it doesn't do a thing, which is good in a way in that it's not gonna hurt the beneficial insects either, okay? But you have to know which First thing is know how to identify the pest before you make a recommendation of what to control it with. We have other type salt, interesting salt flies. The dogwood salt fly gets on the red twig type salt flies and it's sort of yellow, but it's covered by, with a white waxy material. Then we have oak slugs and rose slugs that look like slugs, don't they? But they're actually salt fly larvae. And then a bristly rose sawfly has little seed or hairs on it. And it's not so slug like. But all these, you can't use BT. You're going to have to go with another type of insecticide to get good control. What about scarab beetles in the backyard? Those would be all the things like May beetles, Japanese beetles, green gene beetles. Uh, there's some other beetles too. Uh, black turf grass attenias. So there's a group of these where the, a lot of these will feed on plant material above ground as adults, but then the larvae, what do they do? They often feed, in this case, the ones I'm going to talk about, we call them white grubs. They're going to feed on the roots of plants. And we're really worried in the landscape, especially about feeding on the roots of your grass, because they can just clip them off like taking a scissors to them and the grass will actually die. Here shows some scarab beetle adults, uh, Japanese beetles on the left and may beetles on the right. Uh, may beetles tend to feed in trees at night while the uh, Japanese beetle injury is done when? During the daytime. So sometimes you might go out to your pecan tree and notice, boy, I thought it had leaves on it. And over a few nights, it's devoured the leaves. And you wouldn't see anything in, during the day. Go out at night with a flashlight. You can see them up there feeding. Of course, Japanese beetles, you all know about those. When I came here in 92, they were not in Middle Tennessee and in West Tennessee. 
but eventually they moved their way across the state. It took a while, uh, but now we have them in most counties, probably all counties. Let's look at some insects and mites with sucking mouth parts. You know, this is an invasive pest, this uh, Asian woolly hackberry aphid. Uh, it wasn't here. But in the, it, I guess it came in the 2000s. I got a call one, one day from Knoxville. They said it was snowing. The only problem was it was August. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, these white things floating everywhere. And interesting enough, I've seen those white, that's how they disperse in August. They fly to other trees to lay their eggs and overwinter. But this year I did not see the dispersal. And I'm not sure why their populations were so low, but they apparently were. Uh, I'm not sure what caused it, but they do fluctuate. And lady beetles, like the uh, multicolored Asian lady beetle, which is also from Asia, feeds on these uh, aphids in the trees. And I didn't see as many lady beetles this year because we didn't have as many aphids to feed on. So there's a close relationship, prey, uh, predator prey relationship. But they have waxy filaments that they, they uh, extrude through their pores in their body, but they also produce a lot of this clear honeydew. And you can see the honeydew drips on everything beneath it. So they're on mainly on the underside of the leaves. Any leaves below it gets this sticky honeydew. If your car's below it, if your deck's below it, everything's gonna get covered. Now it's bad enough that honeydew is sticky and clear and you can't see it through it on your windshield, but then sooty mold will turn it black. It actually feeds on the, suit, on the clear um, honeydew. So that's the biggest, probably the, one of the biggest problems with these aphids is they, they produce so much, so much of this honeydew and sooty mold. I didn't really get into how do you control those, but generally we, we uh, drench the tree in the early spring with a uh, imidacloprid or metacloprid. It's a, insecticide taken up by the roots and that pretty much uh, controls the aphids. As far as lace bugs go, there's a lots of different types of lace bugs. We have birch lace bugs, azalea lace bugs, hawthorn lace bugs, sycamore lace bugs, basswood lace bugs. You get the idea, lots of different plants, lots of lace bugs. Generally feed on the underside of the leaves with their uh, piercing sucking mouth parts. In the case of the uh, Azalea lace bug, the uh, eggs are, uh, the overwinter's eggs inserted into the underside of the leaf along the mid vein. Four line plant bugs is another type of sucking bug. And while the, the lace bugs mainly just take out the cell contents, four line plant bugs, when they feed, they inject their saliva, which causes a, a sunken necrotic spot, and then they suck the juices out. And so it does a lot more damage to the leaf, really. Um, they get on over 250 host plants, a lot of different mints and herbs and composite flowers. And so if you have a plant bed with, with a variety of annuals and, and perennials, and you notice that maybe three or four or more plants have these little spots on them, it's not a disease. It's probably these little four-line plant bugs that also overwinter by laying their eggs in the plant material. So one thing you can do at the end of the, uh, in the fall before winter is just cut your old, uh, do some sanitation, cut off the plant material that you got killed by frost anyway, cut it down, bag it, get rid of it. And you're getting rid of some of the diseases and the, in this case, eggs. Uh, let's look at uh, some scale insects. These are, uh, armored scale. So there are a lot of scale insects in the south and armored scale produces a waxy covering over, it's a sucking insect, it, it secretes a waxy layer. So they really don't produce a lot of this honey, sticky honeydew. Most of their energy uh, goes into this protective cover or sometimes called it's a, a, a test or, or it's called armor. And uh, you can see here, euonymus scale, you probably heard of that one. Uh, maybe San Jose scale, a new one called Japanese maple scale, fairly new, but there's a lot of different armored scale. And they're kind of difficult to control because that waxy material sheds, if you spray them with insecticide, 
if it's not absorbed in the leaf, if it's not systemic, it might not kill them because it just sheds like uh, rain on the back of a turtle. See what I mean? So here's a euonymus uh, scale here. Uh, it's an armored scale. The female in the middle, we lifted her off, her scale cover off to show the orange female beneath. You can also see that there's two uh, types of sc uh, scale. There's sexual dimorphism. The, the males have a white waxy scale cover. While the female has more of an oyster shell cover and it's a little more uh, uh, darker color. Most of the scale tend to be on the underside of the leaf, but some can be on the top. They also get on the twigs and just encrust the twigs. This one has three generations a year, starting in April. So you have several gen uh, opportunities to, if you want to spray these or use a systemic insecticide for them. Wherever they feed, you can see a little yellow chlorotic spot on that leaf also. Lumi scale is another armored scale. And this one primarily gets on the trunks of trees and the branches. So it's feeding through the bark. And look at the scale. It's a sort of a round scale cover, cover but it kind of takes on the coloration of the bark. So you might not even know it's there unless you might just say it's rough bark, but it's actually thousands and thousands of scale insects. And you see that red maple, they're really hard on red maple in cityscapes especially, because red maple really weren't, it's not the greatest tree for a cityscape. It likes a lot of, uh, it's more, it would be happier in the forest, okay? It doesn't like all the concrete around it. It's too hot. And uh, you can see, this is a picture taken in August and that plant is so stressed that the leaves are already turning red in August. So that's a combination of stress from the cityscape and also from the scale insects, thousands and thousands sucking the fluid out of that uh, plant. You can see these Japanese maple scale um, on this tree trunk here and they're more of a, <clears throat> they're very tiny little white flecks, but it's a little waxy covering. Beneath it's a purplish looking scale insect but you can just see how many thousands of uh, insects on that trunk. You know, if you had a soapy, uh, if you had a small plant and you had a, a stiff, you know, kind of brush with some soapy water, you could scrape them right off, scrub them off. You can also during the uh, winter time, this time of year, when it gets up to about 50 degrees, like next week it will be, you could actually spray some uh, horticultural oil. We call it a dormant application, and that will help kill some of these scale insects. Also, look at this scale. Looks like a T scale on holly. As you can see here, it's kind of a waxy white stuff, but also the the uh, female scale have a darker color. And then you can see the crawler. When she, the crawler is the first stage of a scale insect to hatch from eggs, and when when the crawler hatches out, it doesn't have that white waxy uh, covering on it. So they are the most susceptible if you're going to spray an insecticide on there. You want look for when the crawlers emerge, when they start hatching out from the eggs, and that's when you treat them. That's the, that would be the best time. Let's look at the uh, some soft scale. Um, you can see here, common, there's lots of common soft scales in Tennessee. Tulip tree scale gets on our state tree. The, tulip tree or tulip poplar. Also gets, there's a magnolia scale. Cottony camellia scale is very common on yews and, and uh, hollies. And if we had very many camellias also. Fruit lecanium scales get on oak trees, oak lecanium scale. You could have both types on oak trees. Pine tortoise scales. And we've seen last summer, we saw a lot of these cottony maple leaf scales and cottony maple scales and others. But uh, soft scale in general, the, you can't separate the scale cover from the insect itself. Uh, often they have a, they do have sort of waxy covering, but it's part of their outer exoskeleton. And uh, they produce lots of honeydew, unlike the armored scale. So you can tell an armored scale from a soft scale and the armored scale don't produce honeydew, but the soft scales produce a copious amount. Here's the, the uh, tulip tree scale. And you can see, 
it takes a full year for these to go one life one uh, life cycle a year so, so it takes a full year and then in late august in september uh, the eggs are laid in august usually and then late august, august through september the eggs hatch out they don't all hatch out at the same time and uh, but that's that would be one time to treat them each female could produce up to uh, 3000 eggs i've never seen quite that many but let's let's say it was only a thousand. That's still a lot of potential scale insects. You'll see here in the picture that uh, Dr. Wyndham took that there's ants tending these scale insects because they are taking the honeydew. They're taking it back to their nest, but in to, in a trade-off, they're protecting the scale from uh, predators and parasitoids that would attack the scale insects. Uh, if you don't get these uh, controlled with insecticides or oil sprays, uh, when the crawlers are coming out, the, the second instar nymphs, those black colored nymphs, can be treated uh, <clears throat> this time of year or in March with a horticultural oil spray. You want to do that when it's in the 50s or higher, uh, so you get a good control of the insect. <clears throat> Cottony camellia scale. Look at these. Uh, these over winter is adults. The adult is that kind of brownish tan uh, color insect. And crawl down off the twigs where they spent the winter and they'll get on the leaves and they'll start laying their ova sacs. Those are a dozen of eggs covered with white waxy fluff and then those eggs will hatch in a matter of weeks but uh, each one of them. So you can see there's gonna be lots of crawlers coming out, aren't there? This is what uh, cottony uh, cushion scale looks, look, looks like on Nandina. Look at all the crawlers that have emerged. Those are the fluted, those little fluted things are the ovisacs. Each female produces a big mass of eggs with white waxy material over it. Beautiful, isn't it? The, uh, Lacanium scales, you can see here, are soft scales also, and they produce lots and lots of honeydew. The driplets of honeydew coalesce and, and will drop, drip on anything beneath it. This happens to be on a willow oak. And you can see in this case, the crawlers are just starting to come out and that's a good time to control them. But uh, interesting about this insect, the little crawlers will then in May or so, move out to the foliage and spend the whole summer. And then when fall comes, later in the summer or early fall, they'll crawl back to the twig from the leaves. And that's where they'll develop uh, through the winter. And then in the spring, they really start to grow in size and become an adult, as you can see here. One generation a year. Some other kind of interesting scale insects are called wax scales and they have thick, uh, they secrete thick wax plates that protect them. So the wax might be a whitish color, but underneath, if you lifted it up, the little scale insects usually kind of a reddish color. I'm gonna show you the Indian wax scale and the Florida wax scale. You ever seen these? I sure see them whenever I go to Memphis. You have a lot of wax scale there. We see them more in the deep south. They like the warmer temperatures and Memphis is just right for them. And if you, the uh, Indian wax scale looks like a little top knot, like it has a, a toboggan on for the winter weather with a little ball on top or something. And uh, you can actually pick these off. They're like chewing gum and dispose of them and you're, you've pretty much got rid of the problem. So if you only have a few, that's all you have to do. Uh, the Florida wax scale you can see here looks a little more more rounded and a little dingier looking. And um, you can see the immatures, the nymphs, and they can still be sprayed, but these adults with that thick waxy covering, it won't work unless you spray something that is systemic, that's absorbed by the roots, taken up by the roots of the plant, or something sprayed on the foliage and absorbed by the leaves. Uh, that will get because they're tapped into the plant so that's where the insecticide pretty much has to go but when they're little nymphs like this you can get control with the oils and soaps and other insecticides with contact 
Have you ever heard of felt scales? We, we have one called azalea bark scale that I would see periodically, but it was never a big deal. Looked like a hostess snowball, remember those? Well, a few years back, we got the crepe myrtle bark scale. Of course, crepe myrtle's from China, and so is this insect. And it's a little oval shaped, uh, white waxy material. It looks like, uh, think of gauze material. It's kind of like woven strands of wax that make this little oval sh football shaped covering. And uh, you can see underneath that's a little reddish insect. And it's easy to spot, and as you all know, uh, first place we found it in uh, Tennessee was in uh, Germantown. And now it's throughout uh, West Tennessee. Well, we also have it now, a year or so ago, we got it in Knox County. So uh, Dr. Jerome Grant has a, a graduate student that is working on this insect in uh, Knoxville. So that helps to have it in Knoxville. We can do more research on this insect. There shows the, the adult the insects are kind of reddish with the little waxy material. And that was taken in uh, Memphis, I believe, in June 29th in 2015. And just at that time was when they were laying. So the eggs hatched in the spring. You had these females. And then and look here, you have uh, this generation here laying eggs. Gravid females with their first egg. Now, how do these overwinter? They'll, they'll overwinter as nymphs. And these nymphs can crawl around and be active. So it's a nice warm day. They will be moving around. This happened to be in uh, February 18th. And let me tell you, it was a little bit warmer uh, that day. It was a nice warm day in Memphis, not like the week we've had. But these, they stay uh, getting, this is on a little twig, maybe a quarter inch size twig. And there'll be little fissures or cracks in the bark and those little scale insects will be there They're waiting for spring to start really growing. How can we uh, monitor for scale insects? One thing I like to do is make miniature sticky traps. So if you, if you see the scale insects on the plant, but you wanna know when those little crawlers are gonna hatch, you can use double-sided sticky scotch tape. You can use electrical tape and get a thin, thin layer of petroleum jelly. And whenever those little crawlers come out, they get stuck on the tape. And then once they start coming out, that's when you wanna use your uh, sprays. Usually you might have to spray twice, uh, put the new, new, uh, new tape out. And it, after you spray a week or so later, if you're still seeing them coming out, you might have to treat again. How about mites? Mites, so we have some mites that will attack plants like the spruce spider mite attacks arborvitae and pine and spruce, these kind of needle evergreens. It's a cool season mite. So it's more active in the spring and then in the late summer and fall. This time of year, they're in the egg stage. So the, the eggs have been laid on the needles, it could be on hemlock. There's also, you know, there's a lot of different uh, mites like this, but these like the cool season. So if those eggs are on the plant right now, what could we do? So next week when it warms up, we could spray with a horticultural oil. Horticultural oil means that you can buy it and on the label it shows it can be used as a dormant application in the winter when it's cold, you know, colder and the plant's dormant, or it can be used in a spring and summer or fall application when the plant is actively growing. Usually the only difference is you use a, a lower concentration, uh, you know, maybe two, two and a half tables, you know, fewer tablespoons per gallon in the summer than you would in the winter. But you can see these eggs. And if you spray with uh, horticultural oil uh, sometime late winter and spring, early spring before they hatch, it will kill a lot of the eggs. So you won't have to really spray for the mites themselves. You just control them in the egg state. Really effective way to do it. Now the uh, southern red mite, it's a pest of broadleaf evergreen plants. And you can see here, uh, it likes, really likes cherry laurel, hotelucan laurels, hollies, azaleas, but I see it the most on cherry laurel. And that leaf should be bright green color. 
but it looks sort of bronze color because they've been taking out the chlorophyll cell by cell. They've been sucking out the contents. And these also have reddish eggs, but those eggs are laid on the underside of the leaf. So if you're spraying with the oil, you can't just spray from the top down. You gotta spray sort of from the bottom up to get them. Two spotted spider mites are what we call a warm season uh, mite because they like the hot summer temperatures and they can go through life stage in about eight days when it's 85 degrees or so. They, they have a white host range. Their eggs are a different color. They're a whitish color and their eggs are not gonna be on these woody ornamentals during the winter time. They're gonna overwinter as adults usually under weeds and such in the lawn and other plants close to the soil surface where they kind of spend the winter. And then in the spring, as it warms up, they crawl up into the plants and start laying their eggs. Again, they can go through a life cycle in eight days. So, so it doesn't take long for, you get, for just a few mites to have an outbreak. And you can see this, the, uh, the uh, damage that they do to that uh, burning bush euonymus the stippling they do and just kind of chloratic spots all over the plant. <clears throat> Let's look real quick at some internal feeders like leaf miners. Wow, look at these things, they're all kinds. Some types are called serpentine like the columbine leaf miner on the right. Makes serpentine tunnels as it feeds. The larval stages do. Others make blotchy type leaf mines like the yellow popper weevil or the uh, the hawthorn leaf mine. And so you can see here, uh, the larvae or the immature stages are doing this. It could be a uh, different type of fly larva, beetle larvae, caterpillar, moth, or saw fly larvae, different types. Let's look at a fly larva, a boxwood leaf miner is probably the one, one of the more common ones you'll see. It takes a full year to go through its life cycle. As you can see here, the larvae are yellowish, and uh, you can see there's more than one in a little boxwood leaf. So after a full year, come spring, those leaves that have been mined are going to be pretty bad shape. You probably want to prune them off, cut, cut it back so you get the new material. New buds will come out and put new nice leaves, but we want to protect that new foliage. Generally, what we've been doing now that we have the, uh, some of the products like imidacloprid, we can drench the root system in the late winter, early spring, uh, before these come out, and it will be up into the leaves. So when the new foliage comes out in late April uh, and, or early May, it's already up into those leaves and it, it will kill the uh, new larvae that are hatching from eggs, usually about first week of May or so. So here's the larval stage, it's yellowish. And once they go in that, most of their life's the larval stage, then the, they go through the winter, then the spring, late winter, spring, they pupate. And the little pupa then has a pointy head and will wiggle uh, underside of the leaf, right through the leaf. And then towards late April, these little uh, orangish midges will come out, start flying around in a little swarm all around the plant. And uh, that, that's where you will see, that's when they start laying eggs on that new foliage. So the old foliage is pretty much shot, but they're gonna uh, get the new foliage. So you wanna protect it. These uh, clear wing moths like the peach tree borer are actually caterpillars. Uh, the male, you can see the male moth there are caught in a pheromone trap. They're called clear wings because they mimic bees and wasps. They don't have all the scales that a typical moth would have. So you have clear areas of wings that makes it more look like a, a wasp or a hornet wing than a, than a moth. And they are also day flying moths. And because of that, they get some protection by mimicking uh, uh, bees and wasps that are kind of, you know, aggressive, that things don't want to, you know, predators might not want to be around them. So it gives them some protection. And they're gonna lay their eggs around the base of the plant in the case of the peach tree borer. And it takes a full year for these, the larvae then chews into the bark, gets underneath the bark and starts feeding for a full year. So we really wanna 
control these by having an insecticide on the on that bark right before those eggs hatch. So you're going to have to be proactive, so to speak. Once inside the tree, they're hard to control. You really don't have much to control. Dogwood borers, you can see here, attack uh, dogwoods and other type plants. And they like to find the kind of rough areas on the bark to lay their eggs. That little moth is not very big. And the, uh, but you can get several larvae in each place. Their frass is kind of a brownish frass. It's chewed up bark and such. And they're, they're working in the cambium, that living tissue. So if you get enough of these wood boring insects feeding on the cambium, you can girdle the plant and cause dieback or, or uh, kill the plant. In the case of these moths, they have pretty long emergence. They first start coming out in late April and I've seen them in, into mid-October. So it's gonna take uh, several sprays over the, from spring to summer to even early, early uh, fall to protect that bark. Metallic wood boring beetles. These are really interesting. The larvae are called flat-headed borers because right behind the head, the thorax kind of flattens out. Why, why are they flattened somewhat? Because they live underneath the bark. So the adults called the metallic wood boring beetle or brew crested beetles. And they, are, they have shiny exoskeletons. And you'll usually see them on the south or southwest side of a trunk of a tree in the spring, May or so, May or June. And they like to be out in the sun, running up the trunk of the tree. And that's where they lay their eggs. So the damage is usually on the southwest or south side of the tree. And the egg hatches, the larvae then is inside the tree and it might be in there for two years. Not just one year, it might take two years to develop. And these can do a lot of damage. Uh, Flat-headed uh, borers like the flat-headed apple tree borer here, uh, you can see where it's, Fed where it's frass, uh, where it's fed, it's made these little. See the brown plates at the bottom left? Those are plates of sawdust like frass kind of stuck together underneath the bark. As the bark peels off, it exposes these plates of uh, excrement, and there's no longer any live cambial tissue there. So, so it's that whole side of the tree is really not conducting any uh, water up and down the tree. Sometimes the, the, the trunk will heal over. You'll see a little spiral type healing you know, with callous tissue, but it's best to protect the trunk of these trees. The product I talked about earlier, imidacloprid and another product, Dinotepheron, which are brand names such as Safari, can be used to, as drenches to protect these trees in the spring. Uh, it kills the insect once inside the tree. Emerald ash borer is actually a type of a metallic wood boring beetle that came from, from Asia, usually probably China. And we first found it around uh, Detroit, Michigan. Probably came in on some you know, heavy equipment or uh, metal parts from China uh, to the, uh, you know, maybe to a, a auto plant. And before we knew it, you know, it was probably 10 years before they knew this insect was in the country. People notice, started noticing the ash trees were dying. And people, what do you do with a dead ash tree? Well, you cut it up with a chainsaw and you take the, the wood and give it to people and you have, you know, it gets cold in Michigan. So uh, people use the firewood and guess what? Over 10 years, they spread it all over the place. And before we knew it, it was in the Eastern US. And then by 2010, this is about 2002 or so. And then by 2010, Wow, we found it in East Tennessee. It had been there a while. And uh, now, then it was in Middle Tennessee in 2013. So it's heading to West Tennessee. And the sad thing is it's gonna kill all our ash species in North America. The larvae uh, feed, uh, you can see here, uh, several larvae will get within a square foot, you might see two or three larvae. And they can just totally with these uh, galleries, they winding tunnels or galleries, they can girdle a tree within a year or two and uh, kill that tree. So ash trees are basically gonna go close to extinct in North America, all species of ash. Nothing we can do, we've, 
release some biological control agents, but uh, not enough of them. So, how are we doing on time? Okay, about finishing You're doing up. Just here. fine. You're doing just fine, Doc. Okay. While, I, while I have you here, let me ask you a couple of questions that we have in the chat. Okay. Sure. Good time to ask you a question. Okay. So the first one was, uh, what was the pest that causes the leaf to look powdery? Powdery? Yes. What was that one? Does anybody <laughs> remember? That doesn't ring a bell. Um, oh, I know what it was. It could have been T scale. It was on a holly, on the underside of the holly, kind of white waxy material, kind of dingy looking. You'll see that a lot in Memphis area. It's an armored scale. Is that what you, you were thinking about? Is that what you're thinking about, Mr. William? Maybe? Yes. Okay. I think yeah, that's what you're mentioning. Yeah. I was. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, do you have any questions about control in that or what to do? I would probably try some horticultural oil as a dormant application, you know, when it warms up in the next few weeks. You can also hit them more than once with dormant, dormant applications. You can do almost a delayed dormant right before the new growth comes out very effective. So you don't always have to go with the highest rate, but a couple applications may be better than one. And then once they start hatching out in the spring, you can hit them with oil. If you just want to use oil again, you can target them or use something systemic might be even better, such as Safari, okay. Dinotepron. Any other questions, uh, Chris? Yeah, so we got two more. We have a comment and then another okay. And, and I was kind of waiting for okay. to pop up. So the comment was, uh, Ms. Pat, I understand the emerald ash borer will also attack French trees. Yes, very good. Uh, yes. We have seen it attack French trees. Uh, the the uh, Chinese French tree is more resistant since it is from over there. And I actually have a Chinese French tree I bought for my yard because I figured it might be able to su survive better. What we do know about it is that they're not as susceptible as ash trees. So if you give them, maybe try to protect them a little bit with some insecticide, or it might not even, it might, you know, knock it back a little bit, but chances are uh, most trees are going to survive it. So that's the good news. Okay. And here's the next one. Here's the last one. And uh, yeah, I kind of knew this question was going to come up at some point. Uh, is imidacloprid dangerous to bees? And of course, that's a common question. We yeah, uh, the uh, imidacloprid and dinotepron that I've mentioned as systemic insecticides, uh, they can, some of that insecticide can get into the pollen and nectar. I think where we've seen our biggest concern with neonicotinoids is when they use it on treatment of seed treatments like cottonseed and big fields in, in agriculture. And I've seen even, I read something recently about birds eating that seed and it'll affect the, the birds in certain ways. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, in the landscape, if you need to use a imidacloprid on just one or two plants, realize that your azalea plant that you're gonna treat is one plant out of thousands in the neighborhood. And most people aren't using any insecticide. So I think it's diluted enough. If you just, if you need it on a particular plant, I still think it's smart thing to use it, especially for these wood boring insects, which can actually kill a tree. So if you need it, use it and realize that in a landscape, you're treating only one thousandth of the plants out there. And so there's plenty of alternate flowers and things for bees to go to. So if you want to help the bees plant lots of flowers that you're not going to treat with any insecticide, plant groups of flowers so they have lots to go to at one time, the more flowers throughout the season, the healthier the bees are going to be. So I think you can do that and uh, be fine and still use the insecticide. Great question. Thank you. I'm going to, I'm going to continue here. Then if we have any other questions at the end, we can go to that. Longhorn beetles have long antennae. Most of these are native. You can see the larvae called round-headed borers because they will tunnel into the wood. 
usually these attack dead or dying trees or stressed trees anyway. But there's a lot of native ones. If you want to get a good collection, cut some firewood and put it in, stack it on your screen porch and they'll come out in the spring and you can catch them on the screens as they come out. But you can see there's lots of beautiful insects here. The larvae, though, the round-headed borers will tunnel deep into the heartwood of the tree, and they can make a tree structurally so it will break in a wind or, a, or an ice storm or whatever. And so you can see here that how they damage the tree. So you don't really want these. You want to use something like systemic to control these, if possible, if you have a tree that's getting attacked. Here's a uh, exotic uh, beetle that we don't have in Tennessee, but it has been found east of Cincinnati. It's called, the, excuse me, the starry sky beetle or also the uh, Asian longhorn beetle. And it, and it looks like little stars in, on the back. It's a black beetle, kind of blue, shiny with little white spots. <clears throat> and it has found several places in the US and wherever we find it somewhere, like Chicago or New York or Claremont County, Ohio, we try to eradicate it. So the USDA will come in because this insect likes maple trees. And if it gets widespread, it could do a lot of damage. And we don't want to lose our maples because we're already losing our ash trees. And we lost our chestnut trees and we lost a lot of elm trees. You see what I mean? We, we, don't, we don't have that many trees. We want to lose another uh, genus of trees. So if we see something like this, let somebody know because we'll try to eradicate it and get rid of it. There are a lot of uh, types of bark beetles too. They feed under the bark. Uh, on a pine tree, for instance, you might have engravers or Ips beetles up in the upper branches. Down at the base, you might have black turpentine beetles or a little higher up, the southern pine beetle. These generally beetles attack stress trees also, especially the southern pine beetle. Trees get a, a stress, they'll attack them in mass. But uh, and most of the time we have to use an insecticide spray on the trunk of the tree, something like Astro, which is permethrin, or bifenthrin, which is onyx. You can spray the bark. Granulate uh, ambrosia beetles are a, like, uh, like bark beetles, but bark beetles feed in the cambium right beneath the bark and girdle the trees that way. These granulate uh, ambrosia beetles will tunnel straight into the tree like you drill a hole in the tree. They'll kick out sawdust-like frass. You see these little frass tubes at the bottom right. And then they inoculate the tree with a white ambrosial fungi. And that's what the larvae feed on. Uh, they are attracted to ethyl alcohol. Can you believe that? Here we are, Fat, fat Tuesday, a lot of alcohol being consumed. And uh, these beetles, are attracted to stress trees that release volatiles such as ethyl alcohol. And so they attack trees often before while they're still dormant in the late winter and spring and attack them. And they can kill the tree because the ambrosial fungi and other pathogenic fungi will get into the tree. Let's look at some galls here. They're really interesting. They're unique shapes. Each type of gall insect or mite produces a unique shaped gall on the leaf. The spindle galls and the bladder galls are made by tiny areified mites. The eye spot gall by a type of a, a fly or midge. Some galls like the, uh, uh, the gall wasp will produce stem galls like the uh, Horned oak gall on the right and the left, the A there is the uh, gouty oak gall. And these are twig galls and they're probably the most damaging because they'll cause uh, uh, the twig to die back. Yeah, so you see those, prune them out. Certain oaks are very susceptible to them. Most oaks aren't, they don't see that many on it. Most galls though that get on leaves, we don't even worry about. They're really not that damaging to the tree. If you look inside a little round marble looking uh, leaf gall and a sinipid or a twig gall and a, uh, a sinipid or a gall wasp, you cut it in half, you'll see the little larvae inside in an inner cell. And those, those inner cells will actually feed uh, nutrients to the larvae. So it stays in there its whole larval life, uh, lifetime 
and then the adults will emerge when it after it pupates. Pretty amazing, huh? So be ready now for the uh, brood ten a seric, uh, periodical cicada. You'll probably not see it that much in West Tennessee, though. I don't think it's in, in Shelby County, but uh, you'll be hearing about it in the news still. Any questions? I know I went through that kind of quick, but there's, there's just always so many things to look at. There we go. All right, does anybody have any questions? I have a question. Um, I'm battling uh, the crepe myrtle scale on two of my crepe myrtles. And I did not realize it was crepe myrtle scale until I read this chapter. So I was thought I was wow, dealing with bugs. Yeah, I thought they were mealy bugs. And so um, I've been battling them actually for a few years. And what I usually do is spray with, I try to get really early in the season, spray with horticultural oil and just use my garden hose um, on like a hot, like a, almost like a pressure wash setting to spray them off when I see them. That's been fine, uh, except I just went out um, a couple weeks ago and they have exploded on my trees. So can you talk just briefly about why um, a pest might, you know, if you're trying to do your routine maintenance, might suddenly um, take off when you think you've been managing it. You know, I don't know if it's that maybe the life cycle I'm not catching correctly or I'm not treating at the right time, but my crepe myrtles are covered right now. So, well, I think uh, that's a great question. A lot of it is with insects is that they have the potential to lay lots of eggs. So they have a high reproductive potential. And so each one of those females can lay a lot of eggs and they'll have several generations throughout the year. And so at least two generations, possibly three. And so I think that's part of the problem. You think you got them, if you just get them in, uh, I think horticultural oil is still good to do this, you know, in the, in the uh, winter. And I would invest in a, a, a pressure washer with a little more power little electric pressure washer that has a little more power and you can uh, clean those off. Do that two, maybe twice or three times in the summer. And I think you can get them under control. So I would just do it, whatever you're doing, I just do more of it. Now, most commercial folks, they're gonna use Safari or Merit, Imidacloprid or Dinotefron, and they're gonna drench it in the spring and because they don't have time to do all that. But if you have the time to just wash them off with some soapy water under high pressure, it can do a real good job, especially on a smooth bark plant like a, a crepe myrtle. So I would just continue doing what you're doing, just do a little bit more of it. Hopefully awesome. that, that Thank works. you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I hope we can get some graduate students and do some studies on things like that just cultural controls, because we don't want to always rely on insecticides. So if we can, we call it some of those type controls like, like uh, prune, you know, some people will prune off the uh, new branches because a lot of them overwinter on the new branches. fungi. Isn't that right? Exactly. <laughs> can, Chris, can I go ahead and start? Yeah, do you want to go? Let's, let's give everybody uh, five minutes. Uh, Dr. Okay. okay. Sounds so, great. A five minute break. Uh, thank you, Dr. Frank. And let's uh, give Dr. You're welcome. a round of applause there, folks. Fill up that chat box. Oh, that please. sounds great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is a lot more fun than just talking about the weather, and <laughs> we're doing that too. <laughs> so, Dr. Dr. Allen, we'll be back at uh, seven twenty, seven fifteen now. So, five minutes for everybody to catch you, you know, a quick little break, and we'll be back at seven twenty. I'm going to practice sharing my screen. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, um, our next professor is uh, Dr. Alan Wyndham, and uh, you read his chapter, so you know more about him than a lot of people do, but 
He is a professor of plant pathology with the University of Tennessee Institute of Agriculture. Uh, he's located in Nashville at the UT Central Region Extension Office. Dr. Wyndham received his undergraduate and master's degrees in plant pathology from Mississippi State University, completed his PhD in plant pathology with a minor in soil, soil science uh, at North Carolina State University. His specialty is the diagnosis and management of plant diseases that affect ornamental plants and turf grass. During his career with UT, Dr. Wyndham has conducted educational programs, consulted with nurseries, greenhouse, and turf industries nationally and internationally. He published over 100 research papers, book chapters, and popular press articles. His current research interests include the diagnosis and management of emerging plant diseases of ornamental plants and turf, and the development of di uh, disease-resistant ornamental plants. In fact, he holds two plant patents for disease-resistant dogwoods. In addition to outreach activities for the Soil, Plant, and Pest Center, He's involved in research projects concerning diseases of dogwoods, black walnuts, roses, and apparently he's interested in virus X and hostas. Uh, from a review of the internet, he's spoken at venues across the South from garden clubs to major conventions. And he can be found on Twitter where he posts regularly as the at symbol UT plant doc. So um, that's all I have, Ms. Dr. Wyndham. It's all yours. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate the opportunity to speak to the class tonight. So we're gonna talk about plant diseases. And as David mentioned, Frank and I do social media. Uh, if you don't follow us on the Soul, Plant Pest Center, I would encourage you to during the season, we put up a lot of interesting images and content. Just a, a way to stay current on what's going on in the world. Dr. Hell and I work at the Soil Plant and Pest Center. Uh, it's in Nashville. We occasionally will get a question from West Tennessee, where can I send soil to? And we do. We test soil right now, we're in the rush, but they're testing soil from all over the state right now. Matter of fact, there's one farm that's a client that we get about 3000 samples from every year. And I think they've finished up running all their samples. So if you haven't soil tested, now's a good time. And you can talk to Dr. Cooper about how to send a soil sample to us to have it tested. So, um, Working at the Soil Plant Pest Center, I'd say one that, you know, I've done this for a long time. I've almost 30. A diagnostic lab excels at are the unusual things. For instance, I had an extension agent to send me an email in October and the, the subject line said alien egg. So you knew it was going to be interesting. And I think I thought, well, it's probably going to be a stinkhorn fungus. That's what I thought. But it was a sclerotium of a fungus. So just first, what is a sclerotium? Well, this is a really, we're looking at a stem here that has a really common stem rot disease called Southern blight. And you diagnose it by the white mycelium and by those little tiny spherical sclerotia, which are tight tightly bound bits of mycelium that actually help it survive winter like where temperatures like we're having right now. So just keep that in mind. These are smaller than a BB, probably half the size or a third the size of a BB. So actually what the agent sent me to ID was this. Uh, this is about 5 million times larger or weighs about 5 million times more than one of those sclerotia, that, you know, the fungus that causes southern blight. So this was really interesting. This uh, client had found this among some trees on the Cumberland Plateau. So actually I knew what it was. And actually we had one of these in, the, in our herbarium um, 
in our collection, and this is another sclerotium, and it's actually a fungus called Woofaporia, and it's named after Dr. Frederick A. Woof, uh, deceased, who worked at Duke University. So actually this, you know, usually most fungi, the sclerotia are so small, you can't see them with the naked eye, or if you can, they're still really small, but this fungus can produce one that can weigh up to 44 pounds and be up to a foot and a half in diameter, fresh weight. So if you see anything weird, you wanna have identified, contact uh, Mr. Lee or Dr. Cooper. They can't do it, we'll give it a shot. But the, the interesting things like this are just amazing. This is actually, what is Wifoporia? It's a wood decay fungus. It causes a brown rot on trees. Uh, it can be buried up to three feet deep. And uh, it's, a, it's an interesting fungus in that uh, Native Americans would take this, dry it down, crush it into powder and make something equivalent to say tortillas. So interesting thing. Uh, as Dr. Hell mentioned and Mr. Sojourner, We've read a lot of publications. This is one of the newer ones that I've been part of. Uh, this actually won the Cavender Award for UTIA this year or in 2020. And it's a, a Rose Disease publication. And so like Dr. Hell said, if you wanna to go to UT Extension, click on publications and you can search by subject or author and our publications will come up. So where do we find plant diseases? Basically you find plant diseases anywhere that plants are grown. And it can be, you know, could be a millionaire's garden, could be a historic garden, could be a botanical garden, or it could be your garden. Plant diseases are normal. Uh, this is a planting of wave petunias that has some stem rot going on in the front quadrant, but it's not unusual to see plant diseases. There are plant diseases that are making the news today. There's citrus greening. You may or may not have heard of that. Sudden oak death. I think in 2019, there were some rhododendron that were shipped out of the West, nursery on the West Coast. And uh, some made it to Tennessee, but it hasn't really been a big disease, but it was a disease in the news. Uh, there's a new disease of beach in the Midwest and in the Northeast that hasn't reached Tennessee, but we're watching that. And then what's pictured here is sassafras that's dead from a disease called laurel wilt. And it's spread by an ambrosia beetle that Dr. Hell mentioned. And it's a you know, fungus that causes a vascular wilt. So there's always, always something new every year. And sometimes we inadvertently move either the pathogen or the insect vector or a plant that's infected. So there's lots of ways that things can move long distance. It was actually predicted that this disease wouldn't uh, get to Tennessee until 2030, uh, but it was here in 2019. Um, then there's one other disease. I call this the Tom Brown virus. It's actually tomato brown rugose virus. It's been found in the UK. It's been a lot of testing of tomato seed in the US so far, it's not here, but it's a pretty damaging virus disease. So let's talk about plant diseases and why do they show up? So actually pathogens are out in your garden right now. Uh, and probably, you know, some of the hosts are too, but the environment's not really conducive right now for plant diseases to occur. But when we have a susceptible host pathogen in favorable environment, that's when plant diseases show up. So the, what we try to do to, to disrupt diseases we try to disrupt the pathogen or modify the environment or alter the physiology or the genetics of the host. And I'm gonna mention some ways that we try to manage diseases. One way is through exclusion, through either legal restrictions or quarantines, through the inspection of plant material and production of disease-free seed in areas not favorable for disease. You may or may not know that Tennessee has a quarantine a boxwood quarantine went into effect February 4th, 2018, almost three years ago. And it simply states that uh, if a nursery out of state is gonna send in, send ship boxwood to Tennessee, that they're gonna be part of a boxwood cleanliness program where they inspect their plants and don't ship them in. 
and that they're going to have the plants inspected just prior to those plants being shipped, boxwoods being shipped to Tennessee. And also the vendor in Tennessee that's receiving the plants has to notify the Tennessee Department of Agriculture that they have boxwoods coming in from out of state so they can be inspected. And the whole reason for this quarantine is a disease called boxwood blight that was new to Tennessee in 2014. Uh, it's actually very common in Western Europe but it was first found in the US in 2011 in Western North Carolina and in Connecticut. And then didn't make it into Tennessee into 2014. It's not extremely common. Like you see here, uh, if you had a boxwood that had boxwood blight, uh, there probably wouldn't be leaves on it right now because they would have fallen off due to the action of the pathogen. But what you would see right now would be green twigs that have little dark black to purple lesions on the twigs. So like I said, not extremely common. There are a lot of other things that will cause problems with boxwoods. I wouldn't be overly concerned. But again, if you see something that doesn't look quite right, contact Dr. Cooper. The other thing we can try to do to manage diseases is eradication. This is a photo I took while visiting the Dixon Gallery and Gardens several years ago. They were steam sterilizing soil in this cut garden, uh, cut flower garden, as a way to manage uh, root knot nematode. So as you might imagine, very tedious work, but you know, steam does a pretty good job at uh, disinfecting soil. So they had steam running through here for about 30 minutes and then they shoveled the soil back into the beds. So we can eradicate uh, diseases sometimes just by pruning out part of a plant that's infected or by disinfecting the seed where we have pathogens on the outer coat of the seed. Those are all things that we can do. As far as protection, sometimes we use cultural methods to protect plants might be how we fertilize a plant. It may be using drip irrigation rather than sprinkler irrigation. Could be using biological controls. There are fun, beneficial fungi and bacteria that are active ingredients of products that you can go into a garden center now and buy for leaf spots and root rot control and stem rots and things like that. And then fungicides can be used also. Pictured here is black spot of rose. Rosarians would be one group that would use fungicides to try to protect their roses from fungal diseases like black spot and cercospora leaf spot. So let's look at this little study I did several years ago where I was looking at uh, different products to protect dogwoods from powdery mildew. And as you can see, the, 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 these trees were both the same size when the test started one was protected with a fungicide, one was not. So kind of, you know, one thing, uh, kind of a take home point here is fungicides work best to, when used to protect healthy plants from infection. So the plant on the right was protected, looks great. The one on the left did not receive any protective treatment. Uh, so it's got lots of powdery mildew and you, you can tell powdery mildew really stunted that plant. So if you are gonna use a fungicide, it's best to start using it while the plant's still healthy. That way you protect all the parts of the plant that the fungus or a fungus might attack. Of course, one of my favorite ways, if you ask me what's my favorite way to control plant diseases, it would be using resistant plants. And if you're buying a woody plant, that means that you're gonna do your homework and before you go shopping, you're gonna say, okay, well, I'm gonna buy this plant, but what are some common diseases in Tennessee? If you just did a Google search, you'd probably come up with maybe one or two diseases. Uh, with dogwood on the left, powdery mildew would be a big one, probably the big disease. And that little dogwood there is one I planted at my town home here in Nashville a couple of years ago. It's one of the dogwoods that we developed in the uh, dogwood program at uh, Tennessee, and it's one called Appalachian Spring. Uh, so it's disease resistant. The Crab apple there is one of my favorites. It's from my former home in Murfreesboro. It's one called Prairie Fire. And Hugh Conlon, a retired extension hort specialist with UT, suggested this when I, we were discussing 
be buying a crab apple, uh, but it's resistant to cedar apple rust, scab, powdery mildew, fire blight, and frog eye leaf spot. So the most five most common diseases. So what I did was I planted this crab apple, enjoyed it for the next 20 years, never had to spray it, never got a disease, and it looked great every spring. So disease resistance, great way to avoid uh, diseases. This is another look at dogwoods. Uh, the dogwood on the right where the foliage looks so nice and healthy is a dogwood called Appalachian Spring that we developed. It's resistant to powdery mildew. The dogwood on the left, it's just a seedling dogwood as you might find out in the woods or a bird might eat the seed and drop it, it might grow. You can tell the leaves are smaller. It's covered with powdery mildew and dogwoods that are covered with powdery mildew are not gonna set as many flower buds in the fall as those that are healthy. So again, disease resistance is a great thing. Now you may or may not know that uh, there is such a thing called tomato disease resistant codes. And if you look at a package of seed or a label in a cell, uh, cell pack when you're buying bedding plants, you might see some of these where V stands for verticillium wilt, F for fusarium wilt, N for root knot nematode. So basically it means that if you see these letters on the label of the tomato you're buying, it's resistant to these different pathogens. For instance, this beef master tomato, this tag from the cell, cell pack tells you that it's resistant V, verticillium wilt, resistant to F, fusarium wilt, and N, root knot nematode. So good things to look for, especially if you've had a problem with any of these diseases in your garden, it's a great way to avoid that problem, say this year. Or if you like to grow your tomatoes from seed, look on the back of the seed packet. Again, we see VFN for resistance to verticillium, fusarium, and nematodes, but we also have resistance to ascochyta, a leaf spot disease, and stemphilium, a leaf spot disease. And if you're not sure when you see these codes what they mean, you can go to Google and just Google tomato disease resistant codes, come right up, really nice tables that tell you which tomato cultivar is resistant to some of the more common diseases. It's a great thing. So at the uh, Soil Plant Pest Center, we diagnosed plant problems and we were without a diagnostician from February 1 to August 1, so I filled in during the pandemic and believe it or not, our sample load really didn't slow down. People were out in their gardens, finding stuff, sending it to us from all over the state. We were diagnosing it. So how do we diagnose it? And as you complete this master gardener training, uh, when the word gets out, people are gonna expect you to help them with their plant problems. So how do you do it? Number one, identify the host. Uh, this seems simple and you would think nobody misidentifies the plant they have, but they do. So the first thing is make sure that you both know which plant you're talking about because I have had discussions with people about their boxwoods and when I coax them to send me a photo or image of, email me an image of what the, the plant looks like, it turns out to be a Japanese holly. It's not even a boxwood. That happens a lot. So just to make sure you know what host person has. Imagine what a healthy plant should look like because in your mind, if you can imagine, if you know that the certain cultivar is supposed to be variegated, well, then you're not really questioning why does this leaf have yellow and green tissue in there? It's not a mosaic. It's normal for this, maybe for this cultivar to have variegation. So that's important to know. What plant parts are affected? So you look over a plant and you look for things like root rot, stem rots, diseases that affect the foliage, such as leaf spots and mildews. Those are all things that you do and you look for signs and symptoms of disease. So a sign means that you can actually see the fungus or the plant pathogen. And usually there's a fungus, it might be a rust, it might be a mildew. And a symptom is basically the damage that's going on. And then the other thing is abiotic or biotic causes. Abiotic would be things like cold injury. Biotic would be something like a fungal or bacterial pathogen. So let's look at some examples. So some symptoms of plant diseases may be leaf spots, wilting of a plant due to a vascular wilt, such as laurel wilt that I mentioned on the sassafras. 
or rotten roots on a plant that has a, a fungal root rot, stunted plants due to, I've already mentioned one thing that caused stunted dogwoods, it's powdery mildew, or a mosaic caused by a virus. So signs might be fungal hyphae or spore masses, rust pustules, smut fungi, or white fungal growth associated with, with mildews. So let's look at some different groups. I think this pretty much follows your, your chapter in the book, but the powdery mildews are usually the easiest diseases to identify. This is powdery mildew on garden flocks, very common on garden flocks. Uh, you, know, you know, unless you just have a favorite cultivar you have to grow, there are cultivars that are resistant to powdery mildew. Otherwise, you're pretty much relegated to using a fungicide. But if it were in my garden, I would go for maybe one called David, a white phlox that's resistant to powdery mildew. And the powdery mildews, like I said, are easy to identify. This is a powdery mildew, I think, on a coreopsis. And we've got white fungal growth, usually on the upper leaf surface, but not always. Sometimes on shade trees, you can have powdery mildews on the underside of the leaf, especially oaks and elms. So it doesn't always hold, but usually it does. Another group that you may run into is downy mildew. And this summer when I was diagnosing plant diseases, I diagnosed the first, I think the first case of cucurbit downy mildew. So uh, it's a very damaging, very quick acting disease. The spores blow in, usually from the deep south, they move up each year and can cause a lot of damage and just wipe out a field. So, you know, one reason maybe to follow uh, our, our lab Facebook page would be because you would be alerted when we find some diseases like this that can be really damaging. Uh, so where do downy mildews, where are they right now? You know, a lot of our plant pathogens are in the leaf litter under the snow and ice, but not downy mildews, they can't survive that. So where are they? Well, they were, we all wish we were right now, either in the Caribbean or South Florida, hanging out. And as the season progresses, the spring, its temperatures is more favorable, they will start moving up and different people watch for them as we do because they're so damaging. A really common downy mildew a few years ago was downy mildew on garden patients and a lot of people quit growing garden patients to sell because of this disease and a lot of people quit buying garden impatients. Uh, it was identified basically white fungal growth on the underside of leaves, the leaves would fall off, the plants would quit flowering, so you just had stems. Because of this, and so this is, uh, this is at my old home in Murfreesboro where I had kind of some sentinel plants that I set out every year and this was late October, so not a lot of damage here, but you can kind of see what downy mildew did to uh, garden patients, knock the leaves off and then they quit flowering. So it was a huge problem, a huge problem for seed pro producers, greenhouses that grew plants, went to alternatives. So for many years, what happened was begonias just exploded, all kinds of begonias to take the place of garden patients and different types of impatients such as New Guinea impatients and sun patients. And you saw lots more coleus and think plants like Terenia that do well in shade. So for many years, this was basically it, uh, but that's changed. There are two companies that have come out with disease resistant garden patients. One is Syngenta Seed. They've come out with the Imera series of impatients and the other is Pan American Seed, which has the Beacon series of garden impatients. So, some of the same colors we enjoyed, same plant. Uh, enough for the last two years, I've seen the Beacon series for sale here in Nashville. So no doubt there probably are, I'm not sure that you would find these at a big box store like Lowe's or Home Depot, but if you have any independent garden centers there, they would probably be more likely to sell these new disease resistant garden patients. So why, why resistance? This shows you a photo of a disease resistant garden patient on the right and on the left, you've got the old fashioned garden patients that were not resistant to downy mildew. So big difference. 
And otherwise you'd just be spraying your guardian patients all season. So when resistance is available, it's definitely the way to go. Another downy mildew that's really common is a downy mildew on basil, totally different organism than the one that we see on cucurbits, pumpkin and the guardian patients. This is unique to basil. One thing that's a little bit different about it is it can be seed transmitted. The plants turn yellow, the leaves fall off. If you look under leaves of infected plants, you'll often see this gray fungal growth. So uh, again, disease resistance. Rutgers University has released uh, downy mildew resistant basil. Cultivar names are obsession, passion, devotion, and thunderstruck. Not sure what the origin is of those names, but Rutgers has been in the forefront of developing these plants. So let's look at, let's look at a couple of others. This is a friend of mine, David, Dr. David Clement at the University of Maryland sent me this photo a couple of summers ago showing a downy mildew susceptible basil in the middle and two cultivars that are resistant to downy mildew. So if you've had a problem with growing basil the last few years, this is disease has been really common in the Eastern United States for several years. Uh, you might think about growing a uh, cultivar that's resistant. And let's move on to rust. So what we see here, the orange we see here is all rust spores. And this would be a sign of disease because we're actually seeing the pathogen. So this would be a really common uh, disease. If you ever see this on blackberries that you're growing, they need to be ripped out because it's a systemic infection and you don't want this to spread among your brambles. If you saw this in a fence row nearby where you have brambles growing, you would want to get rid of this. Now, one of our more common rust diseases is cedar apple rust, and it's unique in that it has, it requires two hosts, and there's lots of different spore stages on this disease. Um, you will have a gall that's on the cedars right now, on eastern red cedar. This is what it would look like. And what's gonna happen is we're gonna have a storm to come through in March and it's gonna be wet and warm, very different from today. And overnight, that gall is gonna change into this. All these fingers of spores come out of that gall and the spores will spread from this to the apple leaves below and where the spores land, you'll get yellow lesions on the apples. So a couple of ways to control this. One would be to use a home fruit spray. But again, if you do a little research and choose, if the cedar apple rust is a problem in your area, there are apple cultivars that are resistant to cedar apple rust. So there's always, I told you early on, there's always something new. Uh, we had a landscaper to walk into our office 2019 with uh, leaves such as the ones on the right. Uh, this is a rust of a native tree, American hornbeam. So anytime I see anything new, I look it up and what I found was this had not even been reported in the US. And I was talking to one of our extension agents about it. And she's like, oh yeah, a uh, arborist said he saw it on European hornbeam a couple miles away. So we went and looked at that garden and there it was on European hornbeam. Now the interesting thing about this rust is it's been reported on European hornbeam in Europe. So that's probably how it got here. Probably some European hornbeam was shipped to the US that had rust on it. And then it just moved to the American hornbeam. So one thing that you're always concerned about is, is it gonna move? Is it gonna survive the winter? Uh, actually, I went back to this garden, uh, fall 2020 and guess what? It did, not causing a lot of damage, but lots of spores. From street view, the trees look fine, but as you get closer, there were lots of yellow spots and lots of rust. So hopefully it won't be too damaging to this native tree. It's a nice little tree. What about virus diseases? This is a shot I took almost exactly a year ago. Uh, I was in Charleston almost uh, exactly a year ago and I was walking around the historic district and uh, just doing what I do. And that's looking at plants for symptoms of plant diseases. And there was this church garden that I went into that had camellias and I found uh, two different types of ring spot symptoms 
on, uh, I think they were both on Camellia japonica. Uh, of course, the flower wasn't really affected, but the leaves certainly were. So two examples of a ring spot symptom. Uh, there are lots of ways that viruses might spread. How do they spread from plant to plant? Well, insects can be a vector of virus diseases. For instance, cucumber mosaic virus can be spread by aphids. Tomato spotted wilt virus spread by thrips. Nematodes can spread tobacco rattovirus, which is, you know, you might say, well, I'm not concerned about that because I don't grow tobacco. But guess what? Tobacco rattovirus is very common on hosta. So if you grow hosta, it's possible you could see ring spots developing on it due to uh, this virus infection. Might spread rose rosette virus. Sap can spread to tobacco mosaic virus. So if I had a greenhouse and I were growing tomatoes or petunias, boy, I would be really hesitant about hiring people that use tobacco products because this virus can survive all the processing that goes through for cigarettes, chewing tobacco, snuff, and you can actually touch a plant after using the tobacco product and spread this virus. And then fungi will spread a virus disease called soilborne mosaic. So this is a fairly common disease in early summer. This is tomato spotted wilt uh, virus symptoms on tomato. This was actually at a garden center that I walked into and saw these ring spots and I brought it back and tested it. It was positive for this particular virus. And this is spread by thrips. But they're all kind of symptoms that you may run into. There's mosaic symptoms and ring spots that we've mentioned, oak leaf or line patterns. Sometimes the plant's just stunted. It looks normal, but it's just smaller. And then sometimes there's flower breaking where you'll have abnormal white streaks in the petal. So this is actually cucumber mosaic virus. Is that a cucumber? No, it's actually a columbine. But most viruses are not host specific. They can affect many different plants. Cucumber mosaic is one of those. Uh, it's often found in white clover. And if you have white clover around your garden, aphids will move the virus from the white clover to cucumbers or to your perennial border. And you can have plants infected that way. And then hosta, another hosta virus is one called hosta virus X. And the symptoms can be variable depending on the, on the cultivar. On the left, you've got a hosta cultivar called Paul's Glory. And this is not a really good example of it, but you see these dark green streaks in the leaf that's abnormal for this cultivar. And in the right, we've got a really common hosta called Golden Tierra that's got more of a, almost a more of a mosaic look to it. Uh, but they're both were infected with hosta virus X. And this is usually spread during propagation. So a few years ago, this is a huge problem in the nursery industry and it's pretty much been cleaned up. Occasionally you'll see plants that have these odd symptoms, but usually not. So that's good. The, you're probably very familiar with this virus disease. This is rose rosette, where you get this weird witch's broom type growth on infected roses. It's a virus disease. It's spread by a little tiny mite called an erified mite. And the plants will, off the roses will all die out sometimes two to three to four years after an infection. So if we look at, uh, this is actually, uh, this was one of our coworkers on the Rose, Combating Rose Rosette Project, Dr. Gary Bashan, who unfortunately uh, is deceased now, but he did a lot of great imaging for us. This is a rose leaf. Uh, this was captured with a scanning electron micrograph. And if you look closely, you see some little orange mites on the leaf and uh, those kind of pink looking uh, almost mushroom looking structures are actually uh, leaf hairs on the rose. And the little spherical white structures are eggs of the mites. So let me show you what the, a close up of the mite that spreads the rose rosette virus. I wish I had it, you all on unmute when I had showed you this to hear your reaction to it. So, you know, uh, these are tiny mites, they are wind blown. Uh, they can actually, and they can also crawl, so they can move. If you have lots of roses, 
where the foliage or canopies connect, they can move from plant to plant or they can blow. They'll actually stand up on their tail and be swept off a leaf. They'll often climb to the highest point of the leaf and then be swept off and blow and randomly land on another rose. And if they are, have the virus, then they can spread it. So, you know, what can rose rosette do? Uh, this was in Murfreesboro at the Avenues a few years ago. Uh, I took the shot in August. And then I went back sometime later and all the roses were dead from rose rosette. Every rose in this planting was infected, heavily infected with the virus. So, and it was, you know, it was a pink knockout rose. So they are really susceptible. So I'll, I'll tell you this, there are a lot of people working on uh, rose rosette right now. We've got one of the largest screening gardens in the, actually the US in Cumberland County at one of our research stations. And we get roses from rose breeders. We've got roses from Australia. We've got roses from Germany that we're evaluating for resistance to rose rosette. So we're not there yet. We don't have roses to recommend that are resistant yet, but we are making some progress. And uh, so just stay tuned for that. Let's talk about Chris. Let's see. I'm going to check real quick, see if there's anything. Okay. In chat. Okay. I don't see anything. Yeah, nothing right. in the chat yet. Somebody just yeah, said, wow. Also, <laughs> put them in chat and I'll peer out, periodically stop. Okay. Okay. Uh, leaf spot diseases. This was a really common disease on oak that we got this year. Uh, it's a fungal leaf spot. And I would tell you this, there are just a lot of common uh, leaf spot diseases of, a lot of common leaf spot diseases of oak and a lot of different plants. And if you're not sure what they are, you can start off with taking a photo of the leaf and send it to Dr. Cooper. And a lot of them, we, we you know, he probably knows, he would know the really common ones and we might know the really common ones, but that'd be a good way to start. Uh, a common fungal leaf spot disease on a, actually not a bad plant. It's just really susceptible to this leaf spot is red tip Fetinia or Fetinia fraseri. And these are all fungal leaf spots. Where's this fungus right now? It's overwintering on the plant and it's overwintering on leaf litter underneath the plant. And when the plant starts leafing out in the spring, then the spores are gonna be wind blown back to infect that new growth. So every year you're gonna get this. So I would say probably, this is probably a plant to avoid because this disease is just so common. So what does it look like? This is actually a plant that before the pandemic, I used to go to UT Martin every spring and teach a plant pathology lab and walk campus and look at plant diseases. And this is a fetinia that was there on campus that was really hit hard by this leaf spot every year. And the last time I was there, we went and the plant was gone because it had died just simply because it was hit every year by the fungus and it dropped leaves and it just couldn't, couldn't tolerate it. So the same fungus will hit Indian hawthorn. So I know this is probably a fairly common shrub that's used in the Memphis area. It's actually used here. And I would tell you this, there are, whereas Fetinia doesn't have any resistant cultivars that I know of, there are several Indian hawthorn cultivars that are resistant to this leaf spot. So if I were gonna buy, if, if I were gonna use Indian hawthorn in landscape, I would make sure that I'm buying a cultivar that's resistant to this fungal leaf spot. Another leaf spot disease that you might run into is one that we call shot hole disease. In this case, it can be fungal or bacterial. There are different type shot hole diseases. The most common are fungal. And what happens is you'll get a uh, lesion on the leaf. The plant tries to shed the pathogen, so the tissue falls out and getting holes in the leaves. Sometimes mistaken for insect feeding, but it's fairly common. And, and one way to know if you're looking at shot hole is it's gonna be a, a plant in the genus Prunus. So if it's a cherry, a peach, a cherry laurel, and it's got holes in the leaves like this, probably a shot hole disease. That really varies on the severity varies every year. 
if we have some rain in late summer, it can be quite severe. So this is September in Franklin, Tennessee. All the leaves have been knocked off of these cherries entrance into a, a neighborhood, uh, all from shot hole disease. But the good news is it's a late season disease. These trees are not dead. They're gonna flower next spring. They're gonna leaf out. And you, what you hope is that this doesn't happen every year because if it did, then it probably would be difficult to control. Now, Yoshino cherries seem to be more susceptible to shot hole disease than other flowering cherry species or cultivars. All right, Dr. Allen, we do have a couple of questions. Just want to stop you right here before we get too far. Uh, okay. Question, uh, I have a question. Let me see, another one just popped in, hold on. So I think I have powdery mildew on my Mexican petunias and it's causing mushrooms in those flower beds. Can I treat them or do I need to get rid of them? Um, so powdery mildew on say a Mexican petunia, probably what I would, uh, what I would say is number one, does it occur every year or it's just sporadically? If it occurs every year, I might treat it, but I'd only treat it if I saw that it was affecting the growth of the plant or the flowering of the plant. Otherwise, I don't think that I would, I don't think I would treat it. Now, I don't think there's a relationship between the mushrooms and the powdery mildew. Mushrooms are really good at feeding on organic matter in beds. So I would bet most mushrooms that you might see associated with ornamental beds or this just there because of maybe of the organic matter in the bed. Um, oh, Dr. Hell asks, is there hope yeah. for resistance to leaf <laughs> petunia? You know, you would think so. You think, uh, there's, there have been new petunia uh, cultivars patented by nurseries. Uh, Berry Farms out in Texas patented a new petunia that I've seen in stores, but it's resistant to powdery mildew, not to this leaf spot. So I think the search is still on. Um, what impact does the mulch have on those cherries? Uh, I don't think much. Those are pretty mature trees. So I think they are okay. I actually saw, uh, last week I saw a crew here in Brentwood that was just piling up tons of mulch up against the trunk of young trees. I hated to see that. But I think in the case of the cherries, it's all shot hole. It's not, uh, not a problem with the mulch. Okay, so the, the another comment is I only noticed the powdery mildew this past summer, not every year. I think I just, yeah, I think I would just keep an eye on it to see if it's a recurrent thing or if it was just a one-time thing. All right, let's move on to, uh, just continue to put your questions in the chat and I'll look for those. So about anthracnose of shade trees. So if you remember back to spring of 2020, we actually had a fairly cool wet spring. And when that happens, you will see a fungal disease called anthracnose. And it, it looks often looks like this. It'll, you'll get uh, diseased areas along major veins and they run out into the secondary veins. Uh, and it might look something like this. This is actually at the Warner Parks Nature Center here in Nashville. This is a sycamore that is susceptible to anthracnose. And last year with the cool wet weather, it was really hammered. So this was, I think, May, but you know, interesting thing about anthracnose and shade trees, if the weather changes and it becomes drier and warmer, the disease just kind of disappears. So let's look at this, let's advance this two months. Same tree, this was in July, weather had changed, it was hot, it was dry, not favorable for the pathogen that caused anthracnose. So the tree recovered on its own. And that's often what happens with anthracnose diseases of shade trees. The weather gets a little warmer, a little drier. The tree's gonna put out another flush of growth. It's good. So <clears throat> I would say don't panic. If you have a tree that looks like the one on the left, just wait a couple months and see what happens. Another common anthracnose disease is spotted anthracnose on flowering dogwood. If you have flowering dogwoods in some springs, they, the flowering the bracts, the white bracts just don't look very good. They look kind of dingy. If you look closely, you might see these little lesions on the bracts caused by a fungus called spot anthracnose. And when the bracts are gone, it can continue to affect the leaves, but it's not a really serious disease. I mean, it does affect 
bloom. It does affect the, the, you know, the showcasing of the bracts in the spring, but it's not anything that's going to seriously damage the dogwood or kill it. Moving on to canker diseases. What's a canker disease? It's a localized infection, usually of a branch, occasionally of a trunk, and usually the branch that's affected will die. So Leyland cypress, not a great plant for an unirrigated landscape because if it gets stressed from drought, uh, it's going to be hit by a fungal disease called a fungus called ceridium. And this was in Franklin, Tennessee. I took this, uh, I think January of 2020 last year. So about a year ago, I took this. And why January 2020 was this symptom showing up? Well, if you think back to what the fall of 2019 was, NOAA termed what we had in the fall of 2019 a flash drought where not only did we like here in middle Tennessee we went like 60 days without any rain and not only without any rain but we were having record-breaking temperatures up in the 90s all the way through October so these plants were really stressed so what happens is in this case you've got a fungus that is lives like an endophyte it's in the plant it's just there doesn't do anything doesn't hurt the plant until it gets stressed. And when it gets stressed, that's when it can attack the plant. So my advice to you would be, if you have woody plants that you really like, and we have a drought going on, water those plants you love, because if you don't, and they're attacked by a fungus that causes a canker disease, there's nothing you can do after the fact. Uh, I took some photos of this a couple of weeks ago. This is black knot. Uh, it hits flowering plum, fruiting plum. Sometimes you'll see this on black cherry. It's a fungal disease. If you have, it's a great, a great time to look for it is in the winter because there are no leaves on the trees and you can see this silhouetted against the sky. You need to go out and prune this out about four to six inches below the knot and get rid of it. And then there are other canker diseases. On the left, this was at a botanical garden I was visiting and I was talking to the staff and they had some red and yellow twig dogwoods. And I said, you know, a couple of things. Number one is during the winter, always a good time to look for plant diseases. And when you see those like such as the ones on the left, go ahead and print those out. It's not gonna get any better. It's only gonna get worse. And the other thing is, if you have a particular plant species or cultivar that gets hit year after year after year, probably what that's telling you is that you don't have that plant sited in a great location. There's something stressing that plant. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't see a disease like this every year. So you might either think of choosing another plant species for that spot or moving this to a different location, trying to figure out one, one that, uh, a location where it will grow better. And I grouped fire blight, which is a bacterial disease of apple, pear, uh, plants in the Rosiaceae family. A symptom that it has, it's really common. It kills the shoots so fast in the spring, just kind of flops over like a shepherd's crook. So what can you do now? If you had fire blight in apples or pear last year, you can go out during the winter and prune out those shoots. They're fairly easy to see. That's where the bacterium overwinters and again, I showed you earlier a crab apple that I grew in Murfreesboro for years, prairie fire that was resistant to fire blight. <clears throat> so I didn't have to worry about this. But I have been in nurseries where this is really severe and I asked the nursery owner, can you grow the cultivars you wanna grow or, or is that decided for you? And they're like, no, I can grow which crab apple and apple cultivars I want to grow. And I said, well, I would take notes on all those cultivars that are severely damaged by fire blight, and I'd never grow those again. And the ones that are healthy and look good, those are the ones that I would grow. Otherwise, it's really difficult to control. So Dr. Hale talked about leaf galls and twig galls. Most galls that you'll see on the stems and leaves are plants caused by insects and mites, but there are a few galls that we'll see that are caused by plant pathogens. For instance, on azalea in the spring when the azaleas leaf out, you might see some fleshy growths on the leaves. Not particularly damaging, not particularly serious. It's a fungal disease. 
there's a, a similar fungus that attacks camellia that causes the fleshy type growth on camellia leaves. Probably would just pick these and remove the leaves. Usually they're not that many, but not particularly damaging. There's also a leaf gall that we see on peach. This is called peach leaf curl. Uh, it's a fungal disease. The fungus is sitting there on the leaf buds right now. So actually it's fairly easy to control the fungus is exposed. If you grow peaches, if you've seen the symptom before on your peach trees, all you have to do is one fungicide spray sometime between when the leaves drop in the fall and the new growth starts in the spring to kill the fungus that's just sitting there on the leaf buds in the winter. And that will do it. Almost any fungicide that you want to choose would work. Another gall that we sometimes run into is crown gall, a bacterial disease, tumor-like growth. I actually found this, I think I took this photo at the Chicago Botanic Garden. So see, I mean, plant diseases can show up anywhere, even in the best garden. So don't feel bad if you see it. You know, in this case, probably would just prune this out. It's possible that it might come back. Uh, but if you only had maybe one or two of these on a plant, I might just leave it. I will say this, if you buy roses that are bare root or bagged or fruit trees that are bare root or bagged and you unbag it and get ready to plant it and you see any of these tumor-like growths on the roots, I would not plant that tree. It probably would take it back. Take that rose or tree back and get your money back from the vendor. This is uh, crown gall on an apple rootstock. So it, what, I mean, what happens basically is energy that could be going to the, to growing fruit, leaves, shoots are going into this tumor-like growth and, you know, it can affect the health of the roots also. So again, if you see this on a plant that you're buying, take it back. It's not really a cure for this. All right, what about stem rots? As you might imagine, a stem rot is just that. It's generally a fungal disease. The fungus attacks a plant right at soil level, attacking the stem. And they can be common. Uh, I don't run into this too often in my, I haven't run into this too often over the years in my garden. Occasionally I'll see it. The, the stem rot that I have run into in the past is this one. And I'm sure you can find this most anywhere in Memphis and that's southern blight and you identify it on the left. I took this photo, at a, this is at a botanical garden where it was attacking hosta. And then on the right is actually a stem of uh, industrial hemp. But you identify it the same way, the white mycelium, the little spherical sclerotia, and it's a hot weather disease. So when are you gonna see this? Probably a few weeks before the 4th of July and after the 4th of July, as long as we're around 90 degrees, you could see this. Now, when I saw this in my garden, what I would do is I would just take a shovel, cut underneath this, it's right on the surface of the soil, cut through the stem and uh, discard all this mycelium and the sclerotia. Otherwise, the sclerotia act as seed and they'll come back next year once it gets hot again in the summer. And then a couple more and we're done. Uh, nematode diseases. Uh, most of them, you may be familiar with some nematodes that attack insects. They're beneficial. A lot of nematodes are what we call free living. They are just kind of hanging out in the soil or on plants and they are feeding on, you know, algae or fungi or protozoan or other microbes, um, not really doing any harm. The ones we're concerned about are the ones that are plant pathogens and plant pathogenic nematodes have one thing in common. Now these are really small. We're not gonna see these with the naked eye. We have to use a microscope when we examine um, nematodes. But what we look for are the ones that attack plants is a mouth part called a stylet that they use to rupture the cells and leaves or, st or stems or, or uh, roots. So if it's a plant parasite, it has this mouth part. The, uh, you may have heard of root knot nematode that attacks the roots of plants, but there are also foliar nematodes that will attack a lot of our shade loving perennials such as anemone or hosta. So if I walk into a garden and I'm interested in 
determining if foliar nematode is present. Usually I'm gonna look at anemone leaves for angular spots, or I'm gonna look at hosta for these linear spots. And basically the symptom depends on the venation of the leaf. So what happens is the nematode's feeding in the leaf. If it's wet and warm, it'll come out on the surface. It can be splashed to an adjacent plant and infest it. Uh, if it's hot and dry, it moves back into the leaf and feeds. And the venation, the, the, the veins will somewhat block the movement of the nematode, giving you the symptoms that you see here. You can't really get rid of this just by cutting off infested foliage. Uh, probably one of the main ways that you avoid this is just to make sure if you're buying hosta or if you're buying anemone that there are no symptoms that may be due to nematode infection. So make sure that the leaves are clean, no symptoms of streaks or leaf spots, things like that. On either one of those leaves, if you cut out the tissue and put it in water, the nematodes would move right out. And I've taken like one of those lesions, it's like, you know, a few millimeters across, chopped it up, put it in water and had hundreds of nematodes to move out of that. So if you see a leaf that's infested, there are a huge number of nematodes that are there. The nematode that causes probably the most problems in gardens would be root knot nematode. And, you know, Jason Reeves at the West Tennessee Research and Education Center, he's had a, you know, he and I have looked at some issues with uh, flowering bedding plants where root knot has become established in some beds, uh, but certainly on tomatoes and other vegetables, it can cause a lot of damage. These photos were actually taken from the Master Gardener demo garden behind our office in Nashville, where they were growing some heirloom tomatoes that had no resistance to root knot nematode. Um, and once I pulled the plant up and washed the roots off, this is what they looked like. They were just covered with galls from the, the nematodes are feeding outside, but mainly inside those roots. So a root knot nematode feeds inside the roots. The female produces an egg sac or egg mass that we're looking at here, and it can have three to 500 eggs. And the little nematodes that you see here are some that have just hatched from the eggs. And this is the stage that burrows into the roots and starts the feeding, which causes the gall-like growth on the roots. And as you saw in this photo, makes the, the tomato very unproductive due to this infestation. So what can we do? Number one, uh, you know, you could solarize an area covered with clear plastic during the middle of the summer for several weeks, and the temperature will actually get hot enough to kill a lot of the nematodes. Now we've already discussed uh, the tomato disease resistant codes. And one of the main ways of avoiding this in vegetable gardens is to use cultivars that are resistant to root knot nematode. So if you've had a problem with this, that's one thing you could do. And then another thing you could do that we haven't discussed is, you know, grafting of tomatoes is, uh, is done. You can buy grafted tomatoes or you can watch a video on YouTube and buy the little clips and do it yourself. But what you could do is, your favorite heirloom, you could cut the top off and you could graft that onto a rootstock that's resistant to root knot nematode. And that would be a way to avoid it. All right, and then this is the last disease group I'm gonna talk about and then we, we can address any questions. Uh, root rot disease is fairly common on all types of plants. Uh, this happens to be a blue Pacific juniper that's infected with Phytophthora root rot, but Basically, discolored roots, decayed roots uh, happen on plants that are, you know, in standing water. They're watered excessively. There's contamination from soil uh, or irrigation water that's contaminated with the fungal pathogens that cause root rots. And basically, if you, the plants that we just look at, so why is it that plant on the right wilted? Well, you pull it out of the pot and look at it, all the roots are dead. So there's, no, there's nothing there to transport water from the bark mix up to the needles, so they wilt. So I always ask master gardener groups, how many of you check the roots of plants before you buy them, say if they're in containers or cell packs? A few people will usually raise their hands, most don't, but I can tell you every time I buy plants in a cell pack, small pots, gallon pots, 
always check to see if there's any sign of root rot. Now, as I told you earlier, my wife and I moved into a townhome a few years ago, closer to my office here. So I don't have to make the commute in from Murfreesboro anymore. And she wanted some, some dwarf conifers for our small garden. So we went to a independent garden center that had a lot of dwarf conifers and we looked and there were some that I just said, nope, 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 because the roots were, most of the root system was dead due to a fungal root rot pathogen. Uh, so a different root rot is black root rot. This one is common on Japanese holly. That would be hollies like Hellerai holly, um, soft touch holly, Hugendorn, but it also affects uh, blue holly and uh, inkberry, which is also in the holly family. You may have yellow foliage, you may have branches that are dead, but if you pull the plant and look at it, you'll see roots that are discolored. And these are some roots that I washed out from a Japanese holly that was infected with black root rot. So, you know, it doesn't, usually doesn't kill the plant, but it does make it look sickly so that most of us would not want it. Uh, this disease, this root rot is also fairly common on pansy and viola. So when I buy pansy and viola in the fall, it has to have a brilliant white root system for me to buy it. Otherwise, I won't buy it because I'm afraid that it may have black root rot. And that's it. And if you've got any questions. Yeah, there were a couple of questions in there. One was about uh, nematodes and hosta, but I think you may have answered that question. Well, you know, there's been a lot of research. I had a department head a few years ago that got a grant from the American Hosta Society and uh, it's not really, there's really not a good treatment. I mean, the best thing is just prevention, never take it to your garden. Yeah. And I think Mr. Dennis, you had a question about tomatoes. So you want to uh, open up your mic and ask that question, please, Mr. Dennis? Uh, yes, I will. Uh, when I'm buying tomato seeds, what are, I mean, you know, on the package, you won't see all 12 of those codes. What are the codes that I should be looking for for a few uh, tomatoes in my backyard. So probably the most common codes you're going to see are the VFN, the Verticillium fusarium. And probably the most important is that N for root, not nematode. VFN? VFN. But the N would stand for root, not nematode. And that would be the one, that would be the primo tomato code I would look for. Okay, well, I see packages with more than three letters. Uh, it's doubtful. I would say that was probably the most common three that you'll see. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else have any more questions? And feel free to turn your videos back on, please. Okay. I see Mia has her hand up. Go ahead, Mia. I was trying to put it in the chat, but I was like, hold on, I'm trying, still trying to type it out. No, nah, go ahead. So my, <laughs> so my question, my question really is, so, um, so in a nursery or in a container <clears throat> situation where um, you have roots that have um, what look like, um, it, it looks like almost a cross between a, um, 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 it's some kind of fungal, some kind of fungus, right? And it looks like it might be um, some type of mycelial um, fungus, but I'm not really sure. There are ways to determine whether or not you've got some good or bad bacteria around that root. Well, I, I would say this, you know, again, like, as I mentioned, you have like mushrooms growing in, in a garden bed where there's lots of organic matter. Um, for people that tell me they don't like, you know, mushrooms growing in their landscape beds, be like, you know, my mother, she really liked birds and she would put bird seed out. And when the birds showed up, she didn't fuss. So if you add a lot of organic matter to a bed, you're gonna have mushrooms show up. But let's talk about the ones you might see in a potting mix, some white mycelium or something like that. Most likely 
it's just there for the organic matter, not the plant. I would say most of the fungi that are plant pathogens that would attack roots, you'll never see those. Mm -hmm. So if you're seeing some white fungal hyphae, most likely it's nothing bad. That's what I thought, but I just wanted to ask. Okay, thank you. So that's, I mean, really that's not even a way that we try to diagnose root rot uh, diseases. We actually don't look with our eyes for the fungi because you can't see them. We may look microscopically or we might try to use a bait to get the fungus to grow in it so we can tell if it's there, but you just don't see it. Yeah, I guess with the, with an untrained or, you know, untrained eye, when you're looking at these roots and you see this, um, you know, white, what looks like fungus, you're like, and many times you see it um, primarily in those um, cardboard container, um, cardboard container plant pots. So it's like the I don't know why I can't like put that. my words together tonight. Well, like the peat pot. So it, yes, that's not yes. something that I would be overly concerned about. Like I said, the really bad fungi that would attack roots, you'll never see those with the naked eye. Okay, awesome. The Thank one you. things that you do see are, are usually just neither good nor bad. They're just there. All right, Doc, we do have a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, the first one is, is there any treatment for a fungal leaf spot? Uh, we put in new Hawthorne, I think, uh, in at my church in the fall and it quickly developed spots. Uh, is it an issue with the plants or the soil? Okay, so the fungus would be in the leaf litter and probably since the hawthorn is a evergreen or semi evergreen, probably the leaf spots are still there. So there are fungicides that you can protect, use to protect the new growth this spring. So that, that's the good news. The bad news is that you're gonna have to spray those plants every year from now to eternity, <laughs> which usually is not a good option. And for that reason, unless it's just a huge number of plants, which I would probably look at replacing them with something that's resistant. Because if you don't, they're gonna look bad. And this particular disease on Hawthorne is gonna occur every year and it's gonna knock the leaves off. So uh, one question I see is what's a, what best resource would you recommend for identifying a plant disease? Um, Dr. Hill and I teach a, plant problem diagnosis course for graduate students every other year. I think, you know, probably just, you know, the internet, just Google. If I had a leaf spot on rows, I would probably go to Google images and I would just use a key term, search term, leaf spot on rows. Uh, and you can really, I mean, you can diagnose a lot of things that way. Uh, the, uh, our Facebook page is searchable. If you go to the Soil Plant and Pest Center on Facebook and in the search box, if you will type Soil Plant and Pest Center and then type in the host that you have, it'll search through every image of that host that we've posted since 2012. So generally the things that we post are really common in Tennessee. So that would be, and I would just say follow our page because if you followed our page just for one summer, you would see, you would learn so much about the insects and plant diseases. So it's the Soil Plant and Pest Center on Facebook. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Hale's still here with us. If you have, if you thought of any more insect questions. Hey, anybody have any questions for Dr. Frank? He's still here or Dr. Wyndham? I have a question. Um, I This was so helpful in um, learning about some of the very specific uh, pests and diseases we might encounter. But for someone who's a home gardener, um, do you have suggestions about just uh, like preventative steps that we should be taking if we haven't identified a specific pest, but as we're planning our garden for the year? Okay, so one of the key things that I mentioned was uh, disease resistance. So if you've had a problem with a certain plant or if you're going to try, uh, if you're going to grow basil right now, there's a really good chance you're going to see basil downy mildew. 
So sometimes it doesn't get here to August and you know we've harvest, harv harvested all the leaves that we need to to make pesto. But sometimes it shows up in June and knocks all the leaves off. So there are resistant cultivars you can buy. So that would probably be my best advice. And the other thing is that I always do, just examine plants closely when you buy plants. Look at the roots, look at the foliage, make sure that you start off with a healthy plant. And watch out for those carts that have 50% off on them. Because <laughs> I went to a local big box store one day in Murfreesboro and I asked the employee, I said, do you, you know, are those plants on the cart because they're infected with a disease? And the employee goes, oh no. And I said, well, I see black root rot on Japanese holly. I see leaf spots on this plant. I see virus disease on this plant. And the employee said, who are you? <laughs> but sometimes plants that wind up on those carts are diseased. Sometimes they're not, but just be cautious. You don't want to, you know, you don't want to bring home a pathogen such as a root rot pathogen. Let it get established in a bed at your uh, landscape bed at your home where you're gonna have now have to deal with it every year. So checking plants out before you buy is excellent advice. Thank you. Dr. Frank, you have anything to add? <laughs> well, if you have a vegetable garden, you can always uh, this time of year, turn over the soil from between now and planting time that exposes insects to birds and other predators and to the elements. So it also helps incorporate organic matter. You want to have that really thoroughly decomposed before springtime because certain pests would like that. So just prepare. And then hopefully when you start out in the spring, you have the weeds under control and you'll have a great garden. The biggest problem with gardens is I think is weeds. So not the pest. So there's a question, uh, does fungus come in through potting soils? Usually not. I mean, most potting soils have very little soil in them. If you buy a high quality potting mix, it's gonna be peat based or bark based. And so we really haven't found that to be a problem. We have any yeah. more questions? Any more questions? So how about this? Could you imagine taking Dr. Wyndham and Dr. Hale with you the next time you go buy plants? How cool would that be? <laughs> I think they're oh, right. cool. Sounds like fun right now. Yeah, it sounds yeah. like fun. <laughs> we have done this. Sometimes when we show up at garden centers, they're like, uh, we know who you are. <laughs> Not that we can do anything, but we do like to go in and look, just see what's there. That's pretty good. It's pretty good. So let's give uh, both of them a virtual round of applause. Uh, I do feel in that chat box, you know, with those uh, good words for them. I definitely appreciate them being with us this evening. And I also appreciate you too for always supporting my Jimmy <laughs> County. So thank you so much, you know, for being with us uh, this evening. It, it does mean a lot, you know, to do this virtually. Of course, we will miss seeing you in person because we always know you bring nice little uh, gifts with you when you're in person. Uh, we couldn't do that, of course, but again, I just thank you so much for supporting what we're doing here in Shelby County. You're welcome, Chris, and uh, it's good to see the Sojourners, and it's good to see Mary, all the thank folks. Thank you. All our friends. One of our favorite places to uh, speak is with the Shelby County Master Gardeners, and we sure miss not being there in person, but we uh, always enjoy it. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much. In, person, in a, in a roundabout way. <laughs> Everybody have a good evening. Well, y'all have a good Thank evening. You. Thank y'all again. Hey, thanks a lot. We love your enthusiasm. It makes us all want to be entomologists and plant pathologists. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we all want to be good gardeners too, right? Mm -hmm. Can't wait. Thank you. Yeah, Miss Mary's gotten real good with diagnosing plant diseases and uh, insect pests now. So she and I kind of go back and forth with what is this or what is that? So you should take one of us uh, with you the next time you go to the nursery and see how good we are. <laughs> Oh, there you go. Yeah. All right. Everybody Definitely. Dr. Cooper. See y'all. Right. Bye. Um, Thank y'all. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. That was fun. Thanks so much. Appreciate that. Uh, before we uh, end the evening, uh, Miss Mary, do you have any uh, words uh, for us this evening? 
No, I always enjoy this because I find it so interesting that people can look at the tiniest insect and find something of interest in them. Some of them are really beautiful. You know, you talked to us, was it last week when you talked to us about the insect that, oh, oh gosh, I don't remember its name now, Chris. Was it a lantern? Oh, uh, the I, spotted lantern fly. The spotted lantern fly. And to look at some of these things that we're going to start to see, and it's just fascinating. You know, there's a really interesting world out there, and, it, and I appreciate you bringing it to us tonight. Thank you, Chris. That was good. That's good. Thank you, Miss Mary. All right, Mr. David, Ms. Sheila. Well, personally, I always enjoy listening to Dr. Wyndham and Dr. Allen because they're both so informative and so down to earth. They give us so much information and they're so, so knowledgeable and they really are a lot of fun to be around if we ever get mm -hmm. to see them in person. So look forward to that because you will enjoy them. That was what I was going to say, but <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the the two of them are probably the probably some of the best speakers that we have that come to us. And as professors, they break it down so that as master gardeners, we can understand as opposed to having to be um, a student, you know, in that area. So glad they were able to be with us. Hopefully the snow will go away eventually here <laughs> so we can do something. Yeah, I don't know. Round two is coming tomorrow, I heard, so we'll see. But uh, yeah. <laughs> look, um, yeah, before I end this, uh, remember next week we will talk about hours. So I'm sure there's still, you know, questions about hours. So uh, Mr. David will get with myself and we will uh, go over some of those scenarios uh, before next week. Um, so we will talk about hours and we will talk about vegetable gardening. So I know that is something that a lot of you, you know, want to know about as well. I see the hand claps for that. Um, so again, next week, vegetable gardening with uh, Walter Battle, and it should be fun uh, with Walter, and we will talk about uh, those volunteer hours, okay? Um, Chris, the three weeks after that are scheduled to be um, field trips on Saturday. What's your Yes, and I will thinking? tell you more about that next week. <clears throat> All right. Yes, sir. All right. So if everybody's good, look, I'll take care of yourselves. Stay warm. Uh, if you have any questions, you know how to get in contact with me, uh, Ms. Mary, all the sojourners. So Ms. Franklin, I'm sorry, did you have a question? Yeah, should we continue to hold those Saturdays though? Yeah, continue to hold the Saturdays, please. Uh, and I'll look to uh, talk to Dale. Uh, he and I have already been talking a little bit and I should know a little bit more uh, about that field trip from Dale next week. That information that was, next week. that was actually the nature of my question. Oh, right. Yeah. Keep the Saturdays. Yeah. Keep them there. Hold them. Uh, but we'll have more information next week. And hopefully, uh, you know, we can do that if possible. Uh, so hopefully no more bad weather. You know, the weather warm up a little bit. We can get out, social distance, uh, wear a mask. You know, they're going to tell me all of that. And I'll definitely relay that information to you as well. Uh, but it would be nice to see everybody. Uh, it would be nice to be out and about. Uh, get to know each other a little bit, you know, better and learn about plants, y'all. That's what I'm waiting for. And I don't know about you. I've been cooped up in the house now for about, what, a couple of days because it's, <laughs> it's just been too cold to be outside. Uh, so I, I'm looking forward to some warmer weather and to get out and about in the landscape. So hopefully we're able to do that uh, in a few weeks. All right. So with that being said, it's always good to see your smiling faces and your energy. I can feel your energy through the screen. So have a good night. Good night, everybody. Be safe. Thank Take you. care, y'all. Good night. So when are you thinking about getting together or at least talking about the scenarios? On so what's, the, uh -oh. what's, a good, what's a good day and time for you? Uh, well, you know, we're outside so much of late. Um, <laughs> any day. Any day.
You want to try to do it this? You want to try to do it at the end of this week or yeah, the end of this week? We're gonna to have to if we're gonna. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, discuss it with them. Um, I could probably do it Thursday afternoon. Why don't we see what the weather's like Thursday? Okay. Oh, but you mean just do it like we are now over? Oh, yeah, we could do it on Zoom because I'm, I'm sure we probably can't get out and about. That's what, because they're saying Thursday is still going to be kind of bad. So, yeah, it's going to be tough. And, and it, it's tough, you know, sledding in my neighborhood. I mean, the roads are just. Yeah. Like we haven't been out either. We don't mm -hmm. plan to. So, I haven't been out at all. Okay. Nobody in my house has been out. So, yes, yeah, it's, 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 it's been treacherous. You know, in our neighborhood. Uh, so I don't want to get out if I don't have to. <laughs> That's good. Uh, what time uh, Thursday afternoon would you like? Uh, I'm good. After... See what happens. I can do two o'clock. Well, I don't have my phone here, but I don't think we have anything Thursday, or I don't. Yeah. If you do, just let me know. But yeah, I'm, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much free, you know, that afternoon. I have a meeting that morning, but, you know, after one o'clock, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm good. Okay, why don't we just well, yeah. count on, on Thursday afternoon at two, and if there's some conflict, we, we can reschedule it then. Okay. We'll okay, that sounds All good. All right. All right. Well, thanks a lot. We enjoyed it very much. Yeah, stay warm, y'all. It is cold. Oh, we are. <laughs> I tell you something. Let me tell you something funny, Mashila. So, uh, of course, you know, with all the snow and you know Mason being at home, and you know he's like any little kid. You know, say, so, hey, I can't wait to get outside and play. Oh, okay, you know, let's, let's eat a little breakfast. You know, let's get your jacket and big coat on, all this kind of good stuff, and let's go outside. So, you know, I went outside with him. Uh, about five minutes later, okay, I'm good. We can go back in the house. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's so cold out there, you know? It's about 10 degrees. Or something. <laughs> That's why I said, like, you sure you want to do this? He's like, yeah, I want to do it. Yeah, I let, I let the garage door open and he's like, Woof. yeah. See how long this is going to last. So he went out there and grabbed a couple of snowballs. Like, okay, we can go back in the house now. That's what I thought. Uh -oh. I, I thought it was interesting watching the news. One of the, the uh, reporters was out in it. I don't know if it was today or yesterday, anyway, was saying, don't bother trying to make a snowman because the snow is so dry, so. Yeah, it was dry, but it's just so cold, you know? It's like, yeah. yeah. Well, it's just cold. It's not gone yet. <laughs> no. Yeah, it's not gone yet, so we'll see, you know, knock on wood, at least the power ain't gone out, you know? I know, we're so grateful we didn't lose our power. Yeah, I have a okay. cousin that lives in uh, Austin, Texas, and they, well, this is the second day that they've been without power. So they're actually cooking in their fireplace over the fire. Uh -oh. Yeah, so it's like... Mm -hmm. At least they have a fireplace. Yes, that's what I told them. Yeah. At least you have a fireplace. Yes, I but that's a, no fun. No I know. Fun. And I, I have a niece that lives right outside of the Fort Worth, Dallas area. And they said they've been without power for 48 hours, but said luckily... They have uh, a generator. Oh, good. They have three three children, three young children, and yeah. have a generator, and they've been using space heaters. So uh, they're doing they're doing fine. Yeah, fact, there's a, yeah. you know, they're doing yes, fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we're fortunate. It's cold, but we do have power. So that's what I know. Like, oh, so glad. Yeah. All right. We look right. forward to seeing you. We'll see you Thursday. All right. All right. Take All right. care. Bye. Bye. See you.